salvage and recognition of guests, the Honourable Premier. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Welcome back to my colleagues, uh, those who have joined us online and in the public gallery today. Uh, um, and thanks to all those who reached out when I wasn't here. To I was glad to know I was missed a little bit, Mr. Speaker. So, but I'm feeling better. Um, I want to begin by saying uh, congratulations to again to the UPEI Women's Rugby Panthers uh, participated this past weekend in the U Sports National Championships. Uh, uh, they won the Atlantic Conference this year, as we said earlier. It's the greatest season ever for uh, UPEI Women's Rugby. They finished the season ranked number eight. Uh, in Canada, which is a tremendous achievement considering how far this program has advanced in a relatively short time. On the personal side, uh, Brenton Como was the AUS MVP and was a first-team All-Canadian, uh, a tremendous feat. Her teammate Emily Duffy was a second-team All-Canadian. And James Voy, Mr. Speaker, the winner of the Jim Atkinson Award for U Sport Coach of the Year for Women's Rugby. So congratulations to all, uh, including Jane Vesey, who's done a great job out at UPEI in the Athletics Department. Uh, and uh, when she took the job, she wanted to bring more championships to UPEI, and she's building it slowly. Got the men's basketball team uh, last year at Women's Rugby and others, so on the right path there. Um, Yesterday, of course, was a big day for communities large and small across PEI with our municipal elections. I want to say thanks to all those who put their names forward, uh, who let their names stand for election. Uh, uh, those who were successful, I congratulate them, and those who are outgoing, I say thanks uh, for your contribution. It's an important job. It's a big job. It's a big responsibility. Uh, let me just point out a few uh, mayors who were re-elected, Mr. Speaker, uh, Alan McGuinness and Tignish, Steve Ogden in Stratford, uh, Heather McKenna in North Rustico, Joanne Dumphy Mr. in your hometown, Mr. Speaker of Surrey, Eric Gavin in O'Leary, Rowan Kaisley in Kensington, Minerva McCourt in Cornwall, uh, Randy Ahern in Borden Carleton, uh, Deke Gordon up in Alberton, and of course Philip Brown in Charlottetown, Mr. Speaker. Newly elected mayors, an impressive victory last night in Summerside for Dan Kutcher, Mr. Speaker. Had a chance to talk to Dan last night on the phone, and I'm excited to get to know him better and work with him a little more closely. Uh, and Debbie Johnson down in Three Rivers, uh, who's, uh, who had an impressive victory herself. I also want to say to outgoing mayors, uh, Ed, Ed McCauley in Three Rivers, who was the first mayor of Three Rivers, who brought that amalgamated community together. Uh, there were some growing pains there, but through Ed's leadership, things are moving forward, and he passes on the torch now to Debbie and to Basil Stewart, of course, the longtime mayor of Summerside, who has a lot to be proud of, a real uh, strong, long list of accomplishments in the Western Capitol, so thanks to all those, and all the council who have, were elected, all of those who uh, weren't successful, just thanks very much for the contribution. Uh, politics of all, uh, of all parts, Mr. Speaker, municipal, provincial, federal, or whatever, school board, it, it, is a, it is an important calling and it, it's an important service, so thanks a lot. Uh, I had the opportunity yesterday uh, to meet with uh, our island members of parliament, uh, Sean Casey, Bobby Morrissey, and Heath McDonald come into the office. Minister McCauley was away, wasn't able to attend, but uh, we talked about the priorities of PEI heading forward. We talked at great length about, uh, obviously, housing, Mr. Speaker, the cost of living and the recovery from post Fiona, among other things. It is really good. Uh, that we live in a place, a jurisdiction as small as we do, where all of our politicians, Mr. Speaker, can talk a little more easily and freely with each other than other jurisdictions can enjoy. Uh, we have a good relationship with our federal government, Mr. Speaker, and I think overall uh, the citizens of PEI are the best for, are better for that. And I just want to say on the way to caucus today, I did stop by Ray's Barbershop in Charlottetown to present a certificate of 60 years behind the barber sink for Ray Martin at Ray's Barbershop. I was in for a cut about 10 days earlier, so I didn't quite need one yet. But we did talk about his poll that he does, Mr. Speaker. He takes a poll among all those who come in are asked to uh, weigh in on who they think was, was going to win the mayor's election. And for the 10th or 12th straight time, Mr. Speaker, uh, the people spoke at Ray's Barbershop. They had predicted a Philip Brown victory, and of course it was delivered. So uh, just to Ray, all the staff at Ray's Barbershop, uh, thanks for all you do. It's a great spot to, to hang out and, and hear all the news from Charlottetown and PEI, and I'll see you in about eight or ten days' time. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you. Does that mean there's an election coming, Premier? <laughs> 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 right. 
Uh, I'd like to start off by welcoming Matthew Murphy to the gallery. I know it's not your first time here this sitting, uh, Matt, and it's, uh, it's nice to see you here. Very uh, a school trustee candidate in his district and somebody who's very active from a very young age. Well, you're still a very young age, Matthew, but um, in your community and in politics generally here in the aisle. It's nice to see you again. Uh, I'd also like to welcome everybody back for the second week of the sitting here and of course everybody watching from home and particularly those in District 17, New Haven, Rocky Point. Um, like everywhere else on the island, as the Premier mentioned, there were municipal elections yesterday. And I want to congratulate, as the Premier did, all of the new mayors and councillors from across the province here. And to, and to say thank you to everybody who, who put their name forward. Um, in my own district, uh, in the rural municipality of West River, of Clyde River, and uh, of Kingston, there, we had a mix of uh, both returning experienced councillors and mayors and, and some new faces. And I really look forward to continuing my strong working relationships with not just the municipalities in my own district and the mayors and councillors there, but across this whole province. So again, thank you to everybody who put their names forward and thank you to the voters who came out uh, to vote for these candidates and to the election workers and particularly those uh, uh, who gave up a day. I mean, it was 9, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, who facilitated that election. Elections PEI, of course, was heavily involved in that as well, but there were many other smaller elections outside the, 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 the larger centres that were run by election workers. So thank you for the work that you did to make those elections happen. And today, November the 8th, is uh, Indigenous Veterans Day, as it is every year. And that's a day to remember and recognise the enormous contribution and the legacy and the history and the significance of Indigenous military service to Canada. And there's a lovely event, or what promises to be a lovely event, at the King's Playhouse tonight in Georgetown called Smakness, which is the Mi'kmaq word for, for warrior. And the Mi'kmaq heritage actors will be putting that on. And that's at 7.30 tonight at the Georgetown Playhouse. It sounds like a re through um, music and through song and dance and, and pictures and stories, they will be, they will be commemorating the 80th anniversary of the raid in Dieppe and particularly, of course, the contribution made by Indigenous soldiers and veterans at that time. So I, I, I wish I could make it tonight. I can't, but I, I know that my honourable colleague from Victoria, uh, Charlottetown, Victoria Park, will be there with her cousin, Patricia Bork, and uh, I'm sure you'll have a, a beautiful evening. Uh, and speaking of remembrance, the Sunday was the day when churches across the island had their Remembrance Day services. and. It's been an honour and a privilege of mine for, oh my gosh, well over a decade now to attend the Remembrance Day service at St. Mark's Presbyterian Church here in town. And the clergy team there are Dr. Tom, um, Dr. Tom and his wife Paula Hamilton. And Dr. Tom is not just the clergy at St. Mark's Presbyterian, he is also the military chaplain for the PEI regiment and he's the padre for the Charlottetown branch of the Royal Canadian Legion. And very, very active in ensuring that we remember the veterans here on Prince Edward Island. And each Remembrance Day service at St. Mark's, Dr. Tom, as he's affectionately known there, does a reenactment, a, a drama, to remember a particular soldier, very often an island soldier. Um, always a Canadian soldier, and, and he did that again this Sunday. And it's always very, very moving. He, he obviously spends a great deal of time doing research, um, understanding the history of this individual, and he, he tells the story as that individual. And sometimes the individual will be there in the congregation, sometimes a member of their family will be there, but rem no matter what the situation, it's always a very moving event. And immediately after that, we have the act of remembrance, and I go there to play the last post and, and the rouse. And there's just something about it, and I don't know if it's the accumulated emotions from Dr. Tom doing his, his drama or just the weight of the day, but it's being asked to do that is the, the, the weight of the thing is just sometimes too much. And I, um, I'm always extremely moved when I'm asked to play that. And it's not a technically difficult thing to play on the trumpet, but my gosh, emotionally, it's, it's extraordinarily challenging.
And I want to thank Dr. Tom and Paula for the invitation they keep extending to me and, and for being a part of that service. It really is something very, very special. And I want to thank all of the churches across Prince Edward Island for the acts of remembrance which would have happened on Sunday. Today is also a World Planning Day. And that's an international day when we celebrate the accomplishments of planners and uh, we acknowledge their contributions to our communities. And there are registered planners here on PEI who contribute to many, many aspects of life to the discussions on climate, climate adaptation and mitigation, on housing, on public transportation, on the protect, protection of our resources and agricultural land, on environmental health, on building strong, healthy, sustainable, inclusive communities. And I want to particularly thank within government um, Alex O'Hara, who does fantastic work there, and outside of government, Samantha Murphy, Murphy, who has done tons of work with municipalities in developing their land use plans and bylaws, and is currently the president of the PEI Institute of Professional Planners. So thank you to those professional planners on this World Planning Day for all the work that you do. It is noticed, and it is very much appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown West Royalty, third party house leader. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hello to everybody. And uh, hello to everybody watching from District 14 and across Prince Edward Island. And I wanted to acknowledge Matt Murphy for coming in today. And it's, it's a real pleasure to, to hear what you've done, also what you've done for charities in your own community. And, and we've worked together on a project for the Relay for Life that was truly outstanding. So welcome again today. Um, Saturday, November 5th, marked the beginning of Veterans Week, uh, Mr. Speaker, an opportunity for, for us to honor the bravery of Canadians for everyone who have served in this, for this country and defended the values and freedoms for all. Today, again, as, uh, as, I was, as was noted, today is November 8th, and that's Indigenous Veterans Day. And it's, it's um, the first time we commemorated this was only in 1994. And you, th you think about the history and everything that's, that's coming out in our nation now, and, and this is an important time to maybe t to look at that and to the sacrifices of Indigenous veterans and what they've been through at probably a very difficult time in their lives. So I just want to say thank you to all the Indigenous veterans out there who fought for our country. Um, this year also marks the 105th anniversary of the Battle of Vimy Ridge and the Battle of Passchendaele during the First World War the 80th anniversary of the Dieppe raids during the Second World War, the 70th anniversary of heavy fighting at Hill 3, 355 during the Korean War, and the 30th anniversary of the beginning of the United Nations Protection Force peace support the efforts in the Balkans. So just a few, a few things that our nation has done and, and fought in, and, and this is a very, very important week. And I appreciate the children. You see the children starting to educate, and the, the very much uh, it, it's in our school system. And I, I appreciate all the, the teachers for extending that. And I also want to thank, thank uh, everybody who, who uh, ran in the municipal elections. Um, there's no real winners and losers just on the bat. Everybody's a winner for putting their name forward and, and doing this, no matter, no matter what happened. Um, so I just want to take a second to thank the councillors, uh, the, the ones who got re-elected, the new ones that are coming in, and everybody who was involved. So there's some, there was, democracy was well served last night. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Good afternoon to everybody tuning in from Charlottetown Victoria Park and to my colleagues and to Matthew Murphy joining us today. Um, Mr. Speaker, I had the honour of attending the Pinning Bee last night, the annual event put on by the PEI Advisory Council on the Status of Women and uh, the Premier's Action Committee on Family Violence Prevention, where we pinned all those little tiny purple ribbons together and I thought I might have to give up because my hands just didn't want to work that way. But anyway, I had lots of great discussions and it was just really special to be a part of that little group. And I go through my day today honoring that today is National uh, Indigenous Veterans Day and will not forget the sacrifices that these soldiers made for governments of the day who didn't even recognize them as people. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Deputy Premier. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, uh, welcome back everyone to the legislature. Uh, it was a great weekend in District 4. Uh, attended a uh, well, picked up a takeout of uh, Lobster Supper, which you don't always get in November, but Memorial United Church, they're a very active group, and uh, if you miss the Lobster Supper, uh, during their uh, Christmas craft fair, they have the Mistletoe Cafe where they have lobster croissants, so it's definitely worth the trip. And they're a very, very creative and active group, and there's wonderful crafts there as well. So just a shout out to everyone in District 4. 
Um, it was a great weekend again for harvesting. Uh, speaker, we keep waiting for the weather to change, and I'm sure that's going to happen fairly quickly. We're already a little cooler today, and I just want to wish everyone a safe and successful end to the harvest season. Um, I'd like to uh, just acknowledge the successes of our island farmers and businesses that are at the Royal in Toronto. Um, uh, if you'll indulge me, Mr. Speaker, I just want to congratulate uh, great ro local representation. Uh, Cow's Creamery is winning several awards for their cheese and butter again. The Island Company um, for uh, award-winning cheese. Our treasured Island potato growers, Doug and Nancy King, Emily and Alicia Shaw King, and Trevor McDonald, as well as Daniel Natty, Gabriel Natty, Sawyer Acorn, Isabel Acorn, and Parker Smith, and Ava Johnston for their award-winning beef showings. And uh, there are many more showings this week, Mr. Speaker, and I know uh, our island representation will make us proud. Thank you much and enjoy the day. Mermaid Stratford and the Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise, and I'd just like to say hi to everybody in Mermaid Stratford, especially all the residents of um, Andrews of Stratford, and I look forward to joining with you a little later this afternoon for your Remembrance Day service that you're going to be having, so I look forward to, um, to attending that. And I just wanted to send out a big congratulations to um, all of the uh, councillors that were elected um, last night, especially those um, in Stratford and all of the mayors, um, and thank those that are outgoing. But in particular, I'd like to say thanks to everybody in Alexandra. So um, all of our councillors were offered this year, so we didn't actually have an election in Alexandra. Um, they were all acclaimed, including uh, Mayor Melody Van Ohm. And I just want to recognize the work and effort that all those small um, rural municipalities have put in over the past four years. It's been intense for them, um, trying to get all the bylaws up to, up to snuff and um, maintaining and keeping up with the Municipal Government Act and that five-year plan. So for, to have every single one of them put their names back in is just astounding. So I want to thank all of them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Rustico Emerald. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, pleasure to rise today and welcome uh, everyone to the chamber and everyone watching from District 18, Rustico Emerald, and of course, uh, newly elected mayors uh, of Bredalbin, uh, Irene Novacek, and uh, North Rustico, uh, Heather McKenna, and the councillors in North, North Rustico, Donna Call, Patsy Doucette, Andrea Green, and Margaret Golding, Michelle Pino, and Mariah Smith. And you may notice that there's a, a trend there in North Rust called the entire council are women, um, Mr. Speaker. And that's, that's a trend that we've seen up in, in, in my district uh, in elected representatives. I know that uh, my predecessors were, were mostly women, MLAs, and uh, it's just great to see, Mr. Speaker, that representation. I knew they're going to do a fantastic job. Thank you. Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to congratulate particularly the new mayor elected in Red Alban, a thriving community. Irene Novacek is the new mayor, a most capable woman and an environmentalist, environmentalist and scientist. And um, I'll be curious to see what she will do about the Dixon Road, uh, the main drag, with, if there's a uh, Shovel-ready project, uh, that would be one of them. Uh, so we'll see how she, uh, how she does with that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Did I miss anyone? <clears throat> Statements by members. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I had the pleasure of attending an event yesterday morning at the Community Outreach Centre. The John Howard Society of PEI teamed up with Tukes from the Heart to give clients care packages as well as a warm toque for winter. Tukes from the Heart has a simple mission, warming heads and hearts across the country one toque at a time. This has been their mission right from the start. They have donated thousands of toques Canada-wide through partnering with over 50 nonprofit organizations excuse me, and charities. Tukes from the Heart was founded in 2019 by three students from Hamilton, Ontario, uh, attending McMaster University. These three shared a vision to start a business with a meaningful and positive impact. This is a company whose business model is simple, sell a hat, donate a hat. They are currently on a cross-Canada tour in an RV, making stops to, ser to serve 12 partnering nonprofit organizations along the way. Here in PEI, those two organizations are the John Howard Society of PEI as well as the Adventure Group. 
we were their third stop in Eastern Canada. The goal of the event yesterday was for clients of the centre to feel the love and warmth of receiving a new warm toque as the cold weather rolls in. Clients were also given care packages from the John Howard Society and clients and visitors alike were, all, were treated to pizza, excuse me, and other treats. <laughs> Thank you to Connor Mullen, President of the John Howard Society of PEI, Keith Hillier, the Executive Director of the John Howard Society, Roxanne Carter-Thompson, Executive Director of the Adventure Group, Donna Keenan, the Director of the Community Outreach Centre, and all their amazing staffs for making this happen. The goal is to stay warm together. If you are interested in making these a part of your Christmas plans, like I am, but don't tell anyone, <laughs> please check out their website at tooksfromtheheart.ca. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Summerside, South Drive. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Summerside now officially has a no questions asked 24 hour accessible community fridge. That's right. It's located in the parking lot at the corner of Granville Street and Foundry Street. Two fridges and a pantry for dry goods. This wonderful tool for helping connect those who can give to those who are in need was spearheaded by Jolene Clo. I was pleased to find out about her passion to bring the fridge to Summerside and to do my part to help make it happen. There were numerous obstacles, but Jolene overcame all those obstacles. With the support of many local businesses and individuals and the city, the project gained momentum and now we see the culmination of a community coming together to try and do what they can to help. The fridge had its grand opening on Saturday. There were musicians donating time and talent, plenty of food and other donations flowing in. The stories of passerby of passerbys noticing the delighted look on the face of children who had just opened the fridge and saw something exciting and the constant traffic from the local businesses and individuals dropping food and supplies creating more and more stories of smiles is a truly a shining example of community. I have a feeling that what Jolene has started will snowball into something much larger. That makes me both happy to see the community step up and help each other and sad that our province has deteriorated to the point that so much help is needed. So let's celebrate the efforts of our concerned citizens while working to eliminate poverty on PEI so we don't need to rely on those concerned citizens. We have a massive surplus. We must use it wisely. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member from Tignesh Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last Thursday, Health PEI announced that the Collaborative Emergency Centre at Western Hospital will be closed until at least January 2023. This is yet another example of how rural health care has been completely disbanded by this government. The fight for equitable and timely access to health care in West Prince is nothing new to the residents of the area, but is one that continues to get more and more insulting as the frequency of service disruptions increase, along with the obliviousness and sheer lack of both empathy and urgency by the Minister of Health and Wellness to find a solution to a crisis happening in his own backyard. While access to primary care providers, emergency room wait times and hospital bed availability are problems shared among all islanders, those living in West Prince have the added pressures of wondering how long will it take for an ambulance to get to us, or if the doors of our hospital will be locked when we get there. Where does it end? This government has already taken away the incentives for doctors to work in West Prince area, so more could be available for Summerside and Charlottetown. They've closed our collaborative emergency center and, we'll see, and we will see frequent closures of our daytime emergency department. No matter where you live in this province, having access to emergency care when you need it or where you need it should be a right in 2022, period. So I really hope the Federal, Provincial, Territorial Health Ministers meeting in Vancouver provides the answers we need for rural health here in Prince Edward Island. I know our representative will be well prepared for their meetings as they left three days before the conference actually began. Convenience or coincidence? Regardless, Mr. Speaker, I also wish them a safe and restful flight back because the heat in the kitchen will be even more hotter upon the return. Yeah. <laughs> Questions by members, starting with response to questions taken as notice. No? For our first question, I'll call on the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. 
This morning saw another big unexpected jump in the price of furnace oil. And this, of course, is going to be a shock to many island households, and lots of them will not have the money to pay for the extra 10% for their heating this winter. And that's on top of the already historic elevated prices. A question to the Premier. Will you be increasing the funding for the home heating program to ensure that no islanders go cold this winter? The Honourable Premier. Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, we're continue to look at a lot of different options that we might have to try to help shield islanders from the volatility and the answer to that question will be yes along with other things that we're looking at as well yes now the leader of the official opposition and of course i'm really glad to hear that from from the premier and uh, i hope there are many things that come forward in order to shield islanders and on top of the high fuel prices um, many islanders are, of course, struggling with other financial um, challenges, and one of those is to keep a roof over their heads. Mm -hmm. Housing is a human right, and that's one that's recognized in various international human rights declarations and covenants, and also in Canada's National Housing Strategy Act. So I was a little bit surprised when the Premier, when he was asked at a recent Fiona press briefing whether his government affirmed that housing was a human right, he responded saying, always have, always will. I was surprised, but I was also delighted because that's a far more direct and unambiguous answer than some of the ones we've gotten here in this House when we've asked similar questions. So a question to the Premier. What does housing as a human right mean to you? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and that's a question that I always wanted to ask to the Leader of the Opposition as well, uh, because it is a, an interesting question. I think that uh, I don't think it's outrageous for every person to have a place to lay their head, Mr. Speaker. I don't think that is an unreal request. And I think in a civilized society such as Canada, we should be able to accommodate that. Uh, I, I don't I guess I'd like to get into a little bit more detail about uh, what exactly that means. I, I, you know, I think if it means that that every person in Canada has to be provided a home by the government, I think that's going to be a challenge. I, but I, I think, uh, you know, I, I generally when I'm asked that question, I try to say uh, what I'm saying now, which is I think it's not an outrageous ask. Uh, but I think we need a better definition of what it means, to be honest, and I'm open to what that means, but I think it would, at the f on the flip side, it would be difficult for governments of provincial jurisdiction or federal jurisdiction to bear the full responsibility to provide everybody a home, uh, but uh, there's got to be somewhere in the middle, I guess, Mr. Speaker, so I'd be interested to have a more fulsome discussion. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I mean, I, I, I'm fascinated by that answer, and I, I do look forward to a longer discussion on that, because um, to describe the notion of housing as a human right is not outrageous. I'm absolutely right, but it's far from outrageous. It's absolutely necessary for everybody to have that security and safety from which they can then go forward and live full, productive, meaningful, happy, comfortable lives. So in the wake of Fiona, our caucus specifically asked for supports for tenants and landlords. And that was to ensure that tenants were financially supported if they had to temporarily or perhaps permanently relocate as a result of Fiona. And that timely repairs were able to be made to preserve the quality and the quantity of housing across our province. And we continue to hear from island islanders who are struggling with these costs. A question to the Premier. Now that we know that government was sitting on a massive surplus, why didn't you feel that that was not a worthwhile or necessary investment. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I think through the Minister and, and his department uh, that we have been trying to respond, Mr. Speaker, in many, many uh, facets of that. So I don't think, uh, you know, uh, we've been trying not to help. I think uh, what you've seen over the last number of weeks and months has been, uh, you know, uh, an overwhelming response to try to deal with a crisis, Mr. Speaker, that we've been dealing with for a number of years. Uh, we'll continue down that path, Mr. Speaker, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know how else to continue to answer some of these same questions, but we're, we're certainly not trying to uh, not deal with the problem. I think we're dealing with it at a, at, at a pace and with, uh, with, a, with a goal that uh, I wish previous governments would have taken, Mr. Speaker. We've got a long way to go, and uh, we're going to try to get there and work as hard as we can to do it as fast as we can. Honourable Leader, it's the official opposition. 
Thanks. So I have to respectfully disagree with the idea that we're moving at a pace that is appropriate to meet this problem. We are absolutely not. It's not just previous administrations who have failed this. It's previous ministers in this administration who have also failed to deal with this issue. And of course, another component of the right to adequate housing is ensuring that housing is not just accessible, but that it's, at, that it's affordable. And we've seen housing prices skyrocket under this government. According to the Consumer Price Index from September, rent was up 11.2% year over year. And that was on top of a 3.7% increase in 2021 and a 12.1% increase year over year in 2020. So that's nearly a 30% increase over the course of three years. To the Premier, this government's plan to keep housing affordable is clearly not working. Why should we believe that rising housing costs will suddenly slow down under your administration? Development and housing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member. Uh, very valid points, and that's exactly what we're trying to do right now, Mr. Speaker. Um, last week, we come with uh, legislation to halt the rent hike, uh, Mr. Speaker, because we know tenants can't afford uh, the rent increases right now, and this is what we're working on, Mr. Speaker. That's why we've just come out with the most aggressive housing budget in the history of this province. We need more units, Mr. Speaker. We need the, the famous supply and demand. Uh, we need more housing on the market to, to get the price down, Mr. Speaker, and that's exactly what we're working on. I've had meetings every day, uh, just met with the Construction Association uh, this morning uh, to get an update on where we're at in some of the projects. In the near future, we're going to be able to announce them. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. And I, you know, of course, I'm glad that government is increasing the money it's, it's devoting to housing. But we've had three lost years of inaction under this administration, awesome. years when we should have had thousands of new of new builds and particularly publicly funded builds in this province, along with proper regulation and uh, to, to deal with the demand side. Mm -hmm. There is much anticipation, of course, about the proposed Residential Tenancy Act, which is expected to be tabled this sitting, but I'm not holding my breath. The Green Caucus has been lobbying within this legislation for a whole bunch of things, but one, among them, recognition of housing as a human right to be included in this legislation. The question to the Premier, how will we see this human right reflected in your government's legislation? The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the RTA uh, is ready to go, Mr. Speaker. It will be tabled uh, this session. Uh, we're doing the final touches. Then I'm going to uh, meet with the official opposition uh, as well as the third party, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is uh, something that's been in the works for a while. Uh, the department, when I took over here uh, three and a half months ago, uh, when the topics uh, come up, I know the opposition come with some amendments, Mr. Speaker. And I asked uh, my department to, to really review the amendments, Mr. Speaker. And I'm happy to say that we're going to be able to take quite a bit of those amendments from the official opposition, Mr. Speaker. So I'm hoping we can sit down, uh, get on the same page, and get this uh, very important act through this session. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Time Valley Sherbrooke. In early October, there was a terrible fire at a senior's housing complex in Time Valley. Several residents were displaced and had most of their belongings damaged or destroyed, and one man tragically lost his life. While the fire marshal has deemed the source of the fire undetermined, they note it was likely due to discarded smoking material. Question to the Minister of Social Development and Housing. Did your department receive any complaints or concerns from residents of this building about possible fire hazards in the months leading up to the fire? Social Development and Housing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So that question I have gone back and asked the Department Honourable Member. Um, so what uh, what took place from, from my understanding, Honourable Member, there was a, a lot of rumours in the community of, of uh, this individual and not having uh, uh, power to his, his unit. Um, I don't and I cannot confirm um, if there has been any uh, discussions uh, from uh, tenants in the building to our department. I've gone back, I've asked the department to check every email, every source, uh, but there's nothing that has come back. Uh, I can't say otherwise, but other than there's, there's nothing that the department has to be able to verify that. Time Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, like many seniors, the residents of this building shared their concerns with housing staff in person or over the phone. So, while, as the Minister says, there's no email uh, record of this, they, they did express their concerns. Question to the Minister. 
what happens when housing staff receive calls with concerns related to health and safety within public housing buildings? And what will be done to ensure a tragedy like this never happens again? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So uh, when a call comes in, uh, it's supposed to be reported and, and tracked and, and, and a file in place, Mr. Speaker. And, and that's why um, that there, there's nothing that I can, can see there or that has been brought to my attention. And I'm not taking anything away from the tenants because uh, it's quite possible there could have been a call. Um, but from my understanding, the, the rumors on the street is that this gentleman uh, had no power in his unit, um, which I went back to the department and asked that very question and was informed by the department that if, if power is disconnected in one of the seniors units that Maritime Electric reports back to our department and there's uh, nothing on file with that either Mr. Speaker so uh, I can go back again and, and do another check but as of right now nothing's been brought to my attention. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Uh, the Minister for Social Development and Housing has told me there are five maintenance people responsible for approximately 1,600 publicly owned housing units across the province. The Department of Social Development and Housing has told me there are 13 maintenance people in these positions. Question to the Minister. Can you please clarify, do you have five or 13 maintenance people across the province? The Minister of Social Development and Housing. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. So we have five people that look at the buildings. We might have more maintenance that do the work, but five individuals that search and uh, look after the 1,600 units uh, as a whole, Mr. Speaker, and bring the reports back to the housing supervisor of the work that's needed in some of these units. Charlotte, Mr. Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the clarity. It's clearly not enough. Um, they're putting Band-Aids on years of neglect from this government and some before. I've heard of air filters not being changed in 20 years, tubs leaking into the apartment below, seniors waiting to have safety bars installed in the bathroom, light switches not working, etc. These, these do not just ruin Islanders' enjoyment of housing, they are actively putting their health at risk. Question to the Minister. Can you please break down the types of maintenance people you have? Is there a plumber, electrician, HVAC, general maintenance, cleaners? Minister of Social Development and Housing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, there, there will be. So what has happened right now, we know that obviously five uh, people is not enough, and we've clearly seen, uh, and I'm not defending it in any way, because the buildings that we own uh, need desperate work, Mr. Speaker. So with the housing corporation that, uh, that we have now, we have started to hire more uh, if, within the last two weeks. So this is exactly where we're going, Mr. Speaker. We want a Red Seal carpenter uh, in with the, the housing corp. We want a plumber in the housing corp. We want an electrician in the housing corp, Mr. Speaker. And we're going to be able to uh, do a lot of this uh, renovations and work in-house, Mr. Speaker. So they're being hired on now. We uh, should have a full complement here in the coming weeks. Thank you. Charlotte, uh, Victoria Park. I thought we were hiring them a long time ago. The position of plumber and carpenter have been sitting empty for a very long time. I've had, I've had many seniors reach out to me about various issues in their buildings. When I reached out to the department, I was told there was no record of these issues. The department was not logging concerns from root, routine maintenance checks, and I'm wondering if they were being done with that little staff compliment. So island seniors were forced to phone in their concerns. These seniors started calling the department, yet there's still no record of these issues. Question to the minister. When someone in public housing reaches out to the department with an issue, how does that get recorded? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I can go back to the department and ask that exact question, but I know when I pick up the phone to the housing supervisor and ask of a building, they know exactly what work needs to be done, Mr. Speaker, because uh, the calls do come in. So uh, they are recorded at, at some point. I, I don't know the exact detail, but I will find out and bring that back. Uh, the biggest hurdle was all along is that they haven't had the money and the ability to do it, and I'm making sure we change that, Mr. Speaker. We see uh, the massive uh, money in the capital budget. We know the buildings need work. I'm not going to sit here and make excuses any longer. They need to, the work done, Mr. Speaker, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Money and ability is exactly what they need, and that is what they need from your government, and they haven't got it in three years. Many times when Islanders reach out to me in our office with maintenance or safety issues in provincially owned housing, the department will tell tenants to contact their MLA that we are the only ones who can change things, and I'm happy to push these things forward. People in the department seem unable to make the changes they know we need to make, and this is a failure of leadership. 
Question to the Minister for Social Development and Housing. Why is your department telling tenants to contact MLAs? Are you even asking the civil servants what you lead, what they need in order to help islanders? The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Mr. Speaker, one thing that always amazed me in this House is you can absolutely say anything. Um, there's nobody in the department saying call your MLA on a, on a housing issue, yes, Mr. Speaker. Are. So we meet every second day with my department on a list of housing issues right across the board, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, the staff would never tell somebody to call their MLA. They would pick up the phone. They would pick up the phone, Mr. Speaker, and they would call the, the supervisor. The supervisor would say, this work needs to be done. It's very urgent, Mr. Speaker. We need to get it done. And that's how it works. So, no, there's nobody from housing telling them to call their MLA. There you go. Summerside Wilmot. Mr. Speaker, the emergency shelter line has been people in Summerside for as long as I've known this line existed. We are told everything from the line doesn't book hotels, period, to they won't book hotels in Summerside. I simply can't believe that years after I first raised this, folks in Summerside who call the emergency shelter line are still getting bad information. To the Minister of Social Development and Housing, why is it so impossible to get consistent help for housing insecure folks in Summerside that doesn't involve us having to call a minister at home on a Sunday? Good. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'll be honest, I, I have never had to call the, the line myself, Mr. Speaker. But uh, um, the Honourable Member called me, uh, I believe it was maybe, maybe on Sunday, exactly, uh, with exactly this issue. Uh, we had an individual uh, needing shelter. They weren't feeling that good, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the line, they did end up getting a hotel room. So uh, one thing I did commit to uh, the Honourable Member, uh, there's a lot of miscommunication out there. I'm going back to the Department to make sure that none of this is in policy. And if there is anything stating that we can't provide a hotel room in Summerside, the policy be changed, Mr. Speaker. Summerside, Wilmot. Speaker, the first time I raised this was in July of 2019 to two ministers ago. Don't get me wrong, I appreciate the fact that the minister answers my calls on Sunday, but I worry about all the people who don't come through me. People shouldn't need political interference for supports that are already Stop. supposed to be in place. One example of a woman who called the line twice and was told it was the wrong number, and when another person called to verify, because it definitely was the right number, they were told, oh, I didn't know that I was on call today. To the same minister, the shelter line is yet another example of something contracted out by your department that is allowed to be mismanaged. Years later, why is it that the terms of this contract haven't been made clear so islanders don't needlessly suffer? Uh, thank you, uh, our Honourable Speaker, and thank you, uh, Member. So, obviously, we want to make sure that any individual in need of a home, uh, whether it's temporary or not, especially in the cold, that they have access to, Mr. Speaker. And one thing that I can say about my department is uh, it's all hands on deck. They work with, uh, with all MLAs and everyone that needs to, because a lot of times, Mr. Speaker, that some of these issues, unless they're brought to our attention or my attention, uh, I, I don't know about them, Mr. Speaker. And I'm, I'm happy uh, that the MLAs feel comfortable and I know it's not ideal all the time, but I, I feel when we can do that, uh, we helped a person out that day, Mr. Speaker, and there's a lot more people to, to be helped out. Um, so obviously I can go back to the department and do my best and see what we can do to, to improve that system, uh, Mr. Speaker. But uh, in the meantime, please, all in keep uh, keep working uh, and doing what you're doing because uh, it's certainly helping to change people's lives, Mr. Speaker. Summerside, South Drive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I spent my weekend transporting Summerside residents in need of some help. First, a man evicted who was on the side of the road with all of his belongings. He wasn't even permitted to use the Wi-Fi or, or a phone to reach out for help. Evicted. Get out of here. I was driving home, and there he was on the side of the road with all of his belongings in a pile. Hours later, I had finally found him a place to stay for the weekend and transported him and his belongings to his new, too temporary home. He was given two days to figure it all out. Question to the Minister. Could you find a new home for yourself in two days? If you were kicked into the street, your worldly belongings in a pile on the side of the street, no family or friends to call on, and without so much as a phone to use? 
Honorable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So uh, if that did take place, Honorable Member, uh, and somebody was evicted like that, uh, it is against the law and it is not allowed. So uh, please provide the department with some info that we can follow up and, and go to Iraq on this, Mr. Speaker, because there needs to be given notice before anybody's ever evicted, Mr. Speaker. So if the Honourable Member can do that, I, I can follow up and uh, make sure that uh, incidents like this uh, don't happen again. Summerside South Drive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The department was involved. They cut off his funding for housing because he was, he was living there illegally after being evicted long ago, but he had nowhere, nowhere else to go, Minister. Your department was aware. On Sunday, I was contacted about an unhoused woman. She was sick, in need of medical help, with no way to get it and nowhere to go to heal. She called the shelter support line, and the wrong phone number was recorded by accident. I called to try to make things clear. And when I offered her correct contact information, I was told they don't provide hotel rooms before I was hung up on. Later, after reaching out through every channel we had, straight to the minister, the member from Summerside Wilmot and I got through, and the answer changed. Shelter support called back while she was sitting there with me. She could have one night in a Summerside motel room. Question to the minister. For a woman sick and in need, why in the world is no the first answer she would get and one night, the next answer. Social Development and Housing. It's a very good question, Honourable Member. And uh, when I done a little uh, back checking on that, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the operator on the phone uh, has a very different story that, Mr. Speaker. And I think what we need to do, Mr. Speaker, is be able to record some of these calls to see exactly uh, what, what the issues are, Mr. Speaker. And, and that's one thing I'm co committed to doing, because uh, we see this a lot, Mr. Speaker. And, and there's two sides to the story, and, uh, and I never probably get uh, the most accurate uh, information of what it looks like. So I think we do need to start recording these calls, Mr. Speaker. At the end of the day, our goal is to help every individual out, Mr. Speaker. Uh, from my understanding, uh, this individual uh, did get a, a hotel room uh, in, in the short term, Mr. Speaker. Uh, from my understanding, uh, she's in there now and, uh, and is feeling a lot better. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Summerside South Drive. In January 2021, Sonia Cobb said that putting residents in hotels in their home community was the department's first choice. It's not been the experience of my constituents, Mr. Speaker. Winter is coming. If hotel rooms that MLAs have to beg for are going to be the plan for our unhoused community in Summerside, how are you going to make sure that people aren't turned away or hung up on when they finally get the courage to ask for help? Social development and housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I've asked uh, these exact questions uh, to my department itself, Mr. Speaker. And, and one thing that has happened, uh, a lot of the, the motel hotel units uh, will not rent to us anymore, Mr. Speaker, because um, a lot of the damage and stuff that's been done in the past, Mr. Speaker. So it's government's responsibility to find housing. That's exactly what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. So what we're doing is uh, we, we've got a, a six-bed uh, men's shelter coming, but also, Mr. Speaker, in the coming weeks, we're going to have an announcement on some transitional housing. We know our home population is not going to decrease, it's only going to increase, and we need as more uh, government units as we can absolutely get our hands on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, West Riding. Speaker, the short-sighted decision-making by this government regarding mental health and addiction services in our province continues to have damaging effects. The plan for the future cannot sacrifice the services needed today. While this government insists that the recent changes are made as part of an evolution of care, patients, patients accessing the services no different, and so do staff working in the field. On May 10th, government announced a new partial hospitalization day treatment program to be launched in stages beginning this past June. Question to the Premier, six months later, why have you still not hired your full staff and complement? Staff you have hired have yet to be trained, and why has the why has that not opened as of yet? Well, Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that might be a question better served for the Minister of Health and Wellness. On the general sense, I would say that our government has uh, really taken a transformational approach to uh, mental health and addictions, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have tremendous amount of people working uh, within the communities of Prince Edward Island to provide services to those in need. Uh, we'll continue to do that. As for the particulars on this, Mr. Speaker, I'll take it under advisement and provide an answer as soon as possible to the Honourable Member. Charlottetown West Riding. It's, it's not transformational. It's, it's desperate at this point. Um, government failed to mention in their announcement of the partialized hospitalization program, in, or, uh, in order for it to be implemented, 21 inpatient psychiatric beds were completely 
a race from the system due to the closure of Unit 9 at the QEH, cutting the available in inpatient psychiatric beds in the province by half. Question to the Premier, why didn't you wait until you could actually staff and open the new program before putting people in mental health crisis at risk by closing the inpatient beds that remain in high demand? Honorable Premier. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, these are important questions. I'll, I'll, I'll come back with a more full answer. Just I want to make sure we're consistent in this here. But as I say, uh, you know, through our various uh, uh, investments in the change of approach uh, with mental health and addictions, we have been making a lot of important strides. I would argue it has been transformational, Mr. Speaker. I think if you read experts in the field who have written letters, Mr. Speaker, of support, uh, they would say it's transformational, that we have a unique opportunity to do things, Mr. Speaker, here. I will concur with the honourable member that uh, there are challenges here, uh, and there are many. And we're working to tackle them, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but I'm proud of the investments that we have made in mental health and addictions. I think we've made some important strides. We have a long way to go, and we need to work with everyone to get there, Mr. Speaker. And that's what we're committed to do. Charlottetown West Rosie, your second supplementary. I started off by saying we're sacrificing the services needed today. Um, and there's there the access points, but constituents are telling me access points aren't there. And this is a serious concern. Mr. Speaker, government couldn't even staff Unit 9 pr prior to closing it. Staff reported only around seven of those 21 inpatient beds were actually open before this government shut it down. Staff all voiced finding out about the closure of their work unit in the media. Question to the Premier. Was this program created because you couldn't staff Unit 9? And did you ever think that now you can't staff either because of how you allowed these professionals to be treated? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I guess I would say that, uh, you know, staffing in health care in general is a challenge that every jurisdiction faces across the country, including ours, Mr. Speaker. I think we're trying to make some steps uh, to to uh, to stabilize the system, Mr. Speaker, as we work to transform it, and, and that's the approach that we're on, Mr. Speaker. As I say, I'll take that question again under advisement. I'll provide a full answer to the Honourable Member in short order, but we'll continue to work hard with our partners to provide the best care we can uh, for Islanders, Mr. Speaker. It's a challenging and difficult field. Uh, we have a lot of wonderful people uh, who are helping. We need more, Mr. Speaker, and we're committed to providing the resources to make sure uh, that we can bring more people in to help, Mr. Speaker. Tignesh Pomerow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The decision made by this government to close the Western Hospital Collaborative Emergency Centre until at least 2023 is a decision that will have effects beyond what government would have considered. When you deprive rural PEI access to timely health care, you aren't just putting the residents at risk, but you are also putting those who are left to fill the gaps in service at risk. Question to the Minister of Justice, Justice and Public Safety. When you remove the right for individuals to have timely access to emergency health care, you in turn create a public safety risk. What consultation did your department have prior to this decision being made, and can you provide a timeline? Premier. Mr. Speaker, I don't know if that's a question that should be directed to the Minister of Justice and Public Safety. It's probably better settled uh, for myself, for the Minister of Health and Wellness, and the fact that he's not here today, I will stand and, and, and offer an answer, Mr. Speaker. As the Honourable Member knows and has lobbied hard for, uh, you know, the delivery of health care in Prince Edward Island and across the country is changing, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the CEC is a very, uh, you know, important tool, of course, Mr. Speaker, but what is most important is trying to provide provide services to Islanders, Mr. Speaker, across the board, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, the CEC wasn't terribly utilized, Mr. Speaker, on the whole, uh, to, be, to be quite honest. It was important service. Uh, the doors are open. If someone has to get there, Mr. Speaker, we have wonderful services uh, at Prince County Hospital, etc., in the case of a serious emergency, and we're working to transform the system to make sure that Islanders can get as much service as possible, as close to home as possible, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's a difficult challenge, Mr. Speaker, but we're working on it and uh, trying to do the best we can. Tignesh Palmer Rao. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And what's changing is that volunteers are left to fill in the gaps. Volunteer firefighters are the backbone to emergency response in many rural areas in this province. And with that gap in service, uh, it's, created by closing, it's created by closing the emergency department at Western Hospital. These are the people who will be there to fill it in. They are volunteers. Question to the Minister of Justice and Public Safety. Were local volunteer fire departments made aware that their role will become the primary means for emergency response for West Prince before 
the general public was made aware. Wow. Again, Mr. Speaker, the primary response in an emergency would be our ambulatory services, Mr. Speaker, and that would continue to be in place, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so that, that is uh, first and foremost. There are wonderful volunteers all across the country, Mr. Speaker, across the province. You've been one, Mr. Speaker, for over 30 years. It's a difficult job. It's an important job, but you play a very, very important role, and we're very grateful and thankful for that. And that's part of the beauty of being from a small community like we all, many of us are here, is that there are people who can, who can be there, Mr. Mr. Speaker, for that. But overall, Mr. Speaker, again, the, the, uh, the delivery of health care service is changing, Mr. Speaker. It's a very difficult uh, file for, uh, for people to adjust to, and I understand that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the services that we're offering are solid. They're good, Mr. Speaker. Uh, they're vastly different than what they used to be. Uh, but other than that, Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to try to do the best we can uh, to provide those services, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very grateful for everybody in this province, Mr. Speaker, volunteer paid or otherwise who do everything they can to try to keep Islanders safe, Mr. Speaker, and I'll continue to be indebted to them for as long as I'm here. Taking this panel roll, the second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and because that question was not answered, it, it tells me exactly how these decisions are made, Mr. Pre Mr. Speaker. There are already enough external factors that will be challenging volunteer fire departments, um, enough heading into this winter. They too will be feeling the added financial pressures of the 236 jump in oil and the 21.3 uh, cent jump in diesel that we just saw this morning. Question to the minister. Can we, can, oh, sorry, with call volume expected to increase due to the Minister of Health and Wellness failing to advocate for the hospital in his own backyard, will your department increase funding to volunteer fire departments in the area to ensure that they have the resources needed to pick up the slack of providing a service that should have been provided by government. Yeah. Slash Honorable Premier. Slash well, Mr. Speaker, I just find the question so ironic given the fact that uh, he was part of a government for so long, Mr. Speaker, who did absolutely nothing to try to help with the overall service. Yeah. And they actually politicized the service of health care delivery, Mr. Speaker, to the point where they paralyzed the system. And it's a shame that that would be allowed to happen. It would a shame that it would be allowed to happen, and Mr. Speaker. Should feel shame to over ask these questions, Mr. Speaker. Will we give firefighters more money, Mr. Speaker, if they help? Absolutely, Mr. Speaker, we will. We've been there for every Islander. We'll continue to be, Mr. Speaker. You've politicized the health care system. You continue to politicize it. And I say on behalf of Islanders, shame on all of you for doing it. Stratford Kepik. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in the aftermath of Fiona, we saw many service groups and organizations uh, come together, pitch in, and assist with recovery efforts. Many of these groups uh, actually traveled from off island to, uh, to come and help us. Question to the Minister of Public Safety. Minister, how did the province support these groups who are assisting Islanders in recovery efforts? Honorable Mass of Justice, Justice and Public Safety. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I guess we're talking about volunteers again. Uh, we're uh, very, very, we're very, 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 very happy for the response uh, to uh, Fiona and uh, before that, Dorian, from all our volunteers. Um, the province is there. Uh, for them, we will help them with the costs that, that they have, the fixed costs, and we'll continue to do that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Stratford Kepik. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Or, or, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, one group that did great work uh, was, in fact, an organization uh, called Samaritan's Purse. Uh, they assisted hundreds of island households with repair efforts on the properties, and this wasn't just uh, cleaning up trees. They actually were going into homes, taking out uh, um, uh, damaged gyprock, uh, insulation, so on and so forth. Uh, many of the volunteers, as I said before, are traveling up from off island, as noticed, and are coming uh, and uh, incurring soft costs related to travel. Question again to the Minister of Public Safety. Have these organizations reached out to your office to seek support to help defray some of these soft costs? Honorable Mass of Justice, Public Safety. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Samaritan's Purse were one of the volunteer organizations first on the scene at the EMO office uh, after Fiona hit, and I want to thank them for their work. Uh, I think there were about 180 volunteers from Samaritan's Purse, and they were helping 
hundreds of islanders and they're still on the ground here helping and we will do whatever we can to help them financially thank you mr speaker stratford capic your second supplementary thanks very much uh, mr speaker so I, I was recently contacted by one of these uh, such volunteers from samaritan's purse and uh, this individual actually works at the university of brunswick uh, she was here for close to two weeks, uh, living in one of the trailers at their base camp in, in Stratford. Uh, in her latest correspondence to me, she informed me that she's actually paying for one week's vacation from the university to return to PEI to help again with Samaritan's Purse. And uh, her request, her uh, question to our government is, at the very least, could we provide uh, complimentary bridge passes for these volunteers that are coming over to help as many islanders that they are? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Justice, Public Safety. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and Honourable Member. I want you to thank her uh, from, from myself. Uh, thank you for the work she's doing. And through EMO and through my department, we will ensure that bridge passes are available. Thank you. Thank you. Charlottetown Winslow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, I do also want to echo the thanks to the service groups. And I do want to thank the uh, Minister of Transportation and his department for the quick work on the uh, cleanup for uh, Fiona. Um, outside of power and internet, the next question a lot of the residents came to me is, you know, these trees in my yard, and once they're down, what am I going to do with them? Um, and like I say, the, qu the cleanup was quick. However, for some people, the cleanup was very quick at the start. And then the assurances that they were going to have the debris removed um, it hasn't been maybe as quick for some. So my question to the minister, how many people province-wide have registered with Access PEI and how many have you been able to make it out to? Transportation, infrastructure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've had about 6,500 phone calls to uh, Access PEI right across the province. Um, now the city of Charlottetown is is looking after their own and they do make up a significant portion of those phone calls. Um, I'd have to go back and get the exact number of how many properties we've been able to get to. Obviously, we're uh, prioritizing health and safety properties first, uh, trees across driveways that might fall on a driveway or on a, leaning on a house or whatnot. Charlottetown Winslow. Hey, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, I, I, I appreciate the minister mentioning that, that, you know, that the city of Charlottetown and some of the municipalities have kind of looked after um, their tree removal efforts. Um, my question, though, to that same minister, um, you know, there were some areas in the district that, you know, even though if it was a small city lot, did have quite a few trees on, especially in Sherwood and out in Winslow. And, you know, they got as much as they could up to the roadway and the crews would come along, but maybe weren't able to get all of the uh, debris removed. So my question to the minister, will they, these residents have to call back to either access PEI or back to the city if they want the remaining debris picked up? Transportation infrastructure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know uh, our department did say that <clears throat> we had a November uh, November 1st deadline to bring uh, debris curbside, obviously because the weather is changing, as we noticed today. It's quite a bit cooler out, and the snow is going to come soon. I know there was uh, some confusion perhaps around um, people thought that we would stop picking up debris on November 1st. Um, we're just asking that you not take it curbside after November 1st, but if there is anything there, we will pick it up uh, eventually. There's just, as you know, a lot of roads on our island, and it's going to take a while to get there. Charlottetown Winslow, your second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do appreciate the Minister's answer um, because, again, you know, kind of reiterate what he had said. I've talked about those people who are worried because, again, you know, they've seen maybe their neighbors or they've seen that you know, very early on in the or early on uh, after the Fiona cleanup that, you know, their streets were cleaned up and they are still waiting, checking in day in and day out. So question to that same minister is if the debris is already roadside now, will your department be coming to pick it up? Transportation infrastructure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm assuming you mean in the city? Um, and I can't really speak for the city. They are, they are doing their own debris pickup. But what we've had happen is um, we go through and clean a road, and two days later, every, people just keep bringing out uh, debris because that's how much damage there's been. Um, so it might look, uh, people might think that, well, geez, they skipped us, or are they going to come back? Uh, we will come back and get, and get everything picked up. We're really crossing our fingers and hoping that we don't get any significant snow until January. Um, because there's a lot of cleanup to do, and we're still trying to clear our ditches and our own roads. Um, but we're, yes, if, if there is debris curbside, we will get it picked up eventually. 
Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Land Matters Advisory Committee did absolutely fabulous work looking into two pieces of legislation that we've all known for decades uh, needed comprehensive review. That was the Land Protection Act and the Planning Act. The name of their final report is Now is the Time, and that's a not so subtle reference to the, the inaction of previous administrations to a fistful of reports dating back to the 70s, mm -hmm. all urging um, action in these matters. Question to the Minister of Agriculture and Land. There are 13 recommendations in the Land Matters report. The only one with the word immediate attached to it is the implementation of a province-wide interim land use plan. Um, has this been done? And if not, will the province be hiring, as the report implored you to do, planning staff from outside the department to ensure sufficient capacity in order to get this done immediately? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture and Land. Uh, thank you, Mr. Great Speaker question. and Honourable Member. Uh, land use planning is something that's come up a number of times since I've taken over this department, and I will say yes, we will be doing that. Charlottetown, Victoria Park, final question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we hear the Minister of Social Development and Housing talking about properties the government is buying up, and we hear there's a housing announcement coming almost on a daily basis, it makes me wonder what the plans are for shelters in Eastern PEI. All the community is hearing are rumours, and I would like to give the Minister a chance to share those plans. There are some rumours around the old Riverview Manor, as well as some rumblings about a homeless shelter and an old hostel owned by the monks. Question to the Minister, what is the plan? Will these shelters be 24-7? It is November, and it's getting cold. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, obviously, uh, Mr. Speaker, I've dealt uh, with the Minister of Transportation and, and the MLA of, of Montague uh, on exactly these issues, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, we know there's a need uh, in, in the eastern uh, Prince Edward Island right now, Mr. Speaker. There's a need right across Prince Edward Island. Uh, in the short term, Mr. Speaker, we want to make sure that uh, these individuals uh, are, in a, are in a nice, warm place, Mr. Speaker. The plan is to get to a 24-7 uh, facilities all across uh, PEI, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Um, as we have uh, referenced uh, in the past. So uh, we have ongoing conversations. The next one's coming up with our NGOs and partners that are going to be able to help us work through this, Mr. Speaker. So in the short term, Mr. Speaker, we'll be utilizing hotel rooms uh, to keep the, the homeless uh, off the street, Mr. Speaker, and make sure there's a, a nice warm spot until we can build the infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, for the 24-7 we discussed. Thank you. End of question period. Statements by ministers. The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise today and speak about our municipal elections that just took place yesterday. I first want to thank every person who put their name forward to run for their local government. It takes courage and a shared will to make progressive, positive changes for residents across our island communities. Mr. Speaker, 384 municipal leaders were elected to represent residents from tip to tip. I want to congratulate every single one of them. I can't name them all, but I'm looking forward to meeting them and hearing from them and discussing how we can all work together to move things forward for island residents. There's a lot of work ahead of us and we need to tackle together. I'm looking forward to hearing each municipality's priorities for the residents. I encourage all councillors and mayors to reach out to the municipal affairs and engage with the Federation of Municipalities on any question they may have going forward. Mr. Speaker, staff at the Department of Fisheries and Communities have told me that they've organized and invited all mayors and councillors to an introductory orientation meeting, and these will start taking place on November the 14th up to November the 24th. At this meeting, councillors and mayors will get onboarding material and more importantly, have the opportunity to start building relationships as a council and make connections with our neighboring municipalities. We know that these relations can be valuable. So I would encourage every mayor and councillor to attend one of these meetings. There will be six in total and they'll be held in Brackley, Linkletter, Mount Stewart, North Rustico, O'Leary and also Victoria. CAOs have, have the information about these meetings now and those newly elected or re-elected will receive the information soon. Mr. Speaker, as members of the House, I hope you will join me in congratulating everyone who took part in the general municipal elections. Running for office is important for our democracy and the way of life of Islanders. Local governments are important. 
Thank you for being the voice of your residents and your respective municipality and advocates for building healthy and strong communities across our island. Thank you. The leader of the official opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for the statement and for the commitment to meet with our municipal leaders. Um, I, I'm sure many of them are looking forward to that. Uh, local government is, of course, a really critical part of democracy and politics here on Prince Edward Island. And it feels, at least to me, and I'm sure that, uh, well, I have a sense that this is true for others, that democracy is under threat in so many ways from so many different places, whether that's due to voter apathy, and I know we had a low turnout compared to historically the way things are, whether it's a reluctance to put your name forward on the ballot, and the minister said that 384 were elected. Actually, the vast majority of them were acclaimed. They were not actually elected, and that's a problem, you know? So sometimes it's, it's life in politics. I mean, it can be an ugly and cruel place to live and work, and all of us in this house know that very well, and it's getting worse. And I think it's our responsibility to push back against that and not get involved in that and to try and keep politics as the place where good ideas come forward and people are protected from that sort of thing. And of course we have also on social media uh, misinformation that gets, that gets put out there unchallenged. Mm -hmm. and, and the way that it works, uh, yeah. Uh, so democracy is, is, is under threat. And that's one more reason to thank and congratulate uh, all of the people who came forward yesterday and put their, names, put their names on the ballot. And in many respects, democracy is sort of society's immune system. It's what protects us from, from hostile outsiders. And one of those things I talked to, uh, about some of the issues with, with uh, democracy, and one of them is the distorting influence of money. And that doesn't happen at municipal level. I'm not suggesting that. But I do see, and you know, we have big elections happening in the U.S. today, um, and the influence that money brings, money brings power, and when individuals can accumulate so much money, they acquire a level of power which, which can be destructive to, that, to, that, to, to those democracies' defenses, and they can actually overwhelm it, and that's a huge problem. Again, not a municipal level in Prince Edward Island, let me stress that. But we need to protect, we need to nurture, and we need to, we need to preserve the democracy that we have here. So thanks again to all who ran, uh, to all those who were successful, and, and congratulations to those who weren't too, because it's your involvement, uh, that participation, which allows our democracy to remain alive and well. And I personally look forward to continuing to work with a number of municipal leaders with whom I have long-standing relationships over the last number of years, and also to forging new relationships with the many new councillors and mayors across Prince Edward Island, and to working with them, too, to make our community safer and healthier and stronger. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable members, the power is out all around us. We're sitting in the centre with power. So if the power does go out, we'll take a quick recess. The Honourable Member from Tignish, Palmer Row, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, too, want to congratulate all those candidates who put their name forward uh, to run in municipal elections. Um, you know, both this time and in, and in the past, too, it takes a lot of bravery to do so, and especially to those who put their name forward in the uh, town of Tignish, the municipalities of St. Louis, Memini Gash, Green Mount, Montrose, Tignish, Shore, and St. Felix. Uh, municipal politics is so important, and great things can be accomplished through it. So I, was, I too was disappointed to see that in all municipalities where elections were held last night, that voter turnout was down right across the board. I know the Minister of Fisheries and Communities said in this House last week that his department is a respond to request uh, for service department. But I think the lower turnout uh, could make the case that there may be or may be a need to be more proactive um, approaching this and, and, and to who and how we advertise and try to engage the public to be more involved in all levels of government. Uh, PI, PI has always been a leader in voter engagement right across this country, and I think it's a responsibility that we all share uh, to ensure that this continues uh, into the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of Minister Statements. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. 
Reports by committees. The Honourable Member from Tignish, Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On behalf of the Standing Committee on Legislative Assembly Management, and following the receipt of the report of the Committee regarding Bill 127 on Friday, I move, seconded by the Honourable Leader of the Opposition, that the report of the Committee be adopted. Pursuant to subsection 46.2 of the Legislative Assembly Act and Rule 67, any bill related to the Legislative Assembly or the administration of its offices shall be committed to the Standing Committee on Legislative Assembly Management for consideration and may be brought before the Legislative Assembly in accordance with the procedures for public bills and the rules of the Legislative Assembly. On Wednesday, November 2, 2022, Bill 127, Election Signage Act, was introduced and read a first time. Consequently, the committee met to discuss the potential effects on its jurisdiction on November the 3rd. The recommendation, while this bill does have implications on the operations of the Legislative Assembly, the committee recognizes that should the House decide to pass this bill, the committee will determine how to exercise its powers and duties as outlined in the rules of the Legislative Assembly and the Legislative Assembly Act. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is there any others <coughs> that wish to speak to the report? No? Shall it carry? Sure. Introduction of government bills. Government motions. Orders of the day. Government. The Honourable Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Honourable Premier that the first order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? <coughs> order number one, consideration of the capital estimates in committee. The Honourable Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Honourable Premier that this House do now resolve itself in a committee the whole House to take into consideration grant of capital supply to His Majesty. Shall I carry? Did I miss something? Oh, she asked for the Honourable Member from Tignish Pomerog, Deputy Speaker. His Majesty. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? Yes. Honourable members, while we're waiting for the stranger to come onto the floor, we are on page 9, Capital Expenditure Education and Lifelong Learning. We are in the section Bus Replacement. It has been read and is currently under debate. Could you please state your name and title for Hansard? Gordon McFadgen, Executive Director of Fiscal Management. Thank you, Gordon, and welcome back. Okay, um, my list is going to begin again. 
So again, this section, bus replacement has been read. Are there any further questions? Shall I carry? Total capital expenditure, education, lifelong learning, sixty million three hundred ten thousand. Shall I carry? Page eleven, capital expenditure, environment, energy, and climate action. 2023-2024 budget estimate, land. Appropriations provided for land purchases, buffer zone buyback and restoration, 500,000. Total land, 500,000. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. Welcome back to both of you. Pleasure to see you in Summerside last weekend. <laughs> I have some questions for you about the buffer zone buyback and restoration project. First of all, it looks like it's been underspent by about $200,000. I'm curious what the reasoning for that is. Are you struggling to acquire land? Having a hard time finding people who are interested? What's the reasoning on that? Um, I would say it's probably a, a little bit of everything. Um, it, um, Definitely the, the advertising for the program uh, was uh, kind of pushed out uh, last year. The, the fall of the year is not great time to be out approaching um, locations for purchase of the land when they're kind of working the land. Um, so I think that, you know, this is an ongoing commitment that uh, will be there uh, over the next five years. I think there's $500,000 a year and, and, um, and hopefully they'll uh, kind of pick up some speed and, and get some additional purchases made. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. I'm curious. I mean, we do have a target for land restoration through this program, and if we're struggling to meet it, having a $500,000 commitment each year in and of itself won't get us there. I'm curious what we're doing to make this more appealing. Are you getting feedback on what the challenges are there? I haven't heard of any challenges specifically. Again, through this process, we're kind of trying to set the uh, the funds up for the department to action throughout the year, um, and, um, and I guess I'll, I'll try to get some information back as to what the ongoing efforts may be for you, if that, that would be sufficient. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. I'd appreciate that. I'm curious if we're offering a competitive rate per acre on the land. I'm, I'm just trying to get a yeah. sense of what the challenges for sure. are largely. Um, I, I can comment. We do buy land through several programs throughout, throughout government. Um, like there's probably a couple on the Treasury Board agenda for this week, so uh, I know they do look at a competitive process um, for acquiring the land and, and a negotiation process with, with landowners. So the, you know, the first step is always trying to uh, identify and um, target those that are most valuable to you and then um, and I find the low-hanging fruit of the ones that come up for sale. Um, we're, we're competitive when we're there, and you can try to meet an agreement um, through appraisal and, and things like that. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. Do we have a sense of how much land has been acquired through this program so far? Uh, I, I don't have any information on that. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. If that would be something that could be brought back, it would be really helpful. And I'm also curious what percentage of the budget on this is going to be put towards acquiring land versus the restoration project. I know the minister had originally listed this as one of the pathways in which we could increase our amount of protected land in the province and reforesting it. So I'm curious what percentage of the budget is going towards reforesting it. Um, we definitely would have to own the land first before we of course. Um, go and reforest it. Um, but it is uh, it just I have some notes that is part of it, so I'll have to try to get the components of how much was for land and how much was for kind of upgrade to the land. Sorry, Sir Wilma. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'd be really interested in knowing both of those things. Just uh, we have said this was going to be a pathway to do restoration work, and I'm curious if that work has started already or if the money that's been assigned to this so far has largely been just with land acquisition. So any information you could share on that would be helpful. Then you can put me on the bottom of your list. Paul okay. and Vernas. Yeah, I'd just like to get a little more clarity on this uh, buffer zone buyback issue too. So a buffer zone is about 45 feet. Um, so somebody, I'll just say a, a farmer sells 45 feet of uh, frontage uh, and that uh, we're seeing some people 20 feet, 25 feet, 30 feet have been eroded in one storm. So they sell your land to the buffer zone, the buffer zone erodes, can they sell it again the second time? They buy more land or where, where, what's the policy or where does this end? Great question. Yeah. Uh, definitely, definitely a good question and uh, I'm sure there is, I'm sure some farmland on the beachfronts um, 
what we find is mostly in the watersheds and, and the tributaries where the majority of the farmland is kind of actively used, so there'd be less so um, kind of erosion in those areas, but uh, definitely something we'll, uh, we'll try to get some information on. All area and Vernet. See, see, my perspective would be if, if I didn't have any erosion problems, I really wouldn't have any rinters and sellers. <laughs> so I kind of question the, the whole yeah. premise behind it. That, I mean, you're going to be selling it. If I had a high erosion, I might as well get some money now and get my, it's going to all go away a little later on. So I, I just wonder if the policies are there to kind of define how you're going to be able to make these decisions on where the priority is. Uh, what I tend to be seeing, you're buying properties that have buffer zones, but you're buying the whole properties and they're sensitive areas. And I, I don't have any su disappointment in that decision making, but m maybe the name of the program buyback should be more environmentally sensitive areas versus uh, uh, just only the buffer zone. But anyway, I just wanted to make that comment. And if you want to add to it, I'm, I'm happy to hear your views. I'm probably the least informed person in here on <laughs> views on uh, land buyback. I, I, I can try to find what policies they uh, would have. Um, again, it was a, a brand new program last year, so mm -hmm. I suspect they're into the grow-in phase of this, and, and, and many of the challenges you're mentioning uh, um, will come up and will be addressed. Well, there we go, Vanessa. Uh, no, that's fine, Chair. I just, uh, I guess, I'm just saying that. Uh, Thinking it, it, it what I, what the ones that I've gone through in my district that went through that, they, they have been more like beach accesses. They may have been more sensitive areas, and that's worked fine in that regard. But it's really not buying a lot of buffer zones back, other than what the sensitive areas that they purchased in, within those properties. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Shall the section carry? Equipment appropriations provided for equipment purchases. Laboratory equipment, 265000 Field equipment, 100000 Solar installation, school pilot, 977500 Electric vehicle charging stations, 2639600 $2, Vehicles, 540000 Total equipment, 4522100 Summer side Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. So can you speak to the expected drop in lab equipment spending this coming fiscal year? Um, yes, uh, the lab um, does a, a good job of identifying what pieces of equipment are in service um, within and a replacement schedule for that. So they usually bring forward uh, a rather specific kind of amount um, and related to specific equipment they're, they're hoping to, to replace. Summerside Wilma? Thank you, Chair. And I also note that the field equipment line is dropping by half. Um, yeah, similar, similarly, they, they, they have a schedule of uh, things. I think last year they were looking for uh, an equipment trailer that was a little bit beyond where they were normally budgeted to go. I suspect if you look back in time, that was kind of a one-year spike on that for the field equipment, and they're back to their more traditional levels for, uh, for uh, drones and, and things like that that they use for uh, field work. Thank you, Chair. I noted and was delighted to note that the spending for um, solar installs for schools is tripling, and it looks like there's going to be a, some school pilots starting for solar. Can you give me an understanding of what schools that's going to impact? For, for this particular project, um, it is twofold. It's, it's solar and geothermal, actually, um, heating. Or cardigan. So it started out. It started out as a, um, a solar kind of upgrade. Um, they turned to uh, a geothermal as a, a test site to see how it would kind of uh, respond and, and, and some of the capital costs and kind of the building updates. So um, this is one specific location for this one specific project. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. So it's just Cardigan that's going to be getting this. For this particular budget line, correct. For this particular budget line. Is the solar install going to be sized for the full needs of the school, or is it just to offset some of the costs? I think it's just to offset some of the costs. I, I don't think they can get, the, with the footprint of the building and the number of panels they can kind of get on the roof, that it won't cover the whole electric needs of, of the building. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. Do you have a sense of how big the solar install is going to be? I, I, I do not. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. I, I would be interested in knowing that if that's something you could bring back. And then additionally, what outcomes are you going to be testing? I mean, this is a pilot. So obviously, when we have a pilot, we want to know if this is useful for us to do in other places. So how 
are we going to measure that? What are we looking for from this pilot? I suspect the first will definitely be cost-benefit analysis as to the overall capital cost versus the payback for the project. You always want to make sure that, um, you know, with with the investment that you make, um, that, that you can get some return over the likelihood before you get additional um, capital investments to be required, um, which would be uh, why it's kind of pilot. I think they'll take some earnings uh, to look at all the, the te technologies that may be available. And, you know, they've used, I think, geothermal and, uh, and solar for this one. There, there might be other technologies that they may try in another location. Thank you, Chair. So, based on that answer, those don't sound like the sort of data sets you'd be able to acquire quickly. Are you imagining that this will be the only project of its kind in the next couple of years? Uh, as we get a little further in the budget, I think there's there's some other funds available in uh, transportation for other government buildings. So, um, so I don't want to get ahead of myself, but uh, yeah. it, it, I think there's some other projects coming. Thank you, Chair. So I'm curious, forgive me for not being familiar with this already, are these solar panels installed currently? or? I think they're in the easy? process between now and into the spring, so there is some budget for this project next year as well, so I think the, budget is, the project is underway and, and will be kind of up and running um, within the next, next school year. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. Uh, if you have anyone else on your list, I don't want to hog your I can bring time. you, uh, put you back on the list if you choose. Please. Sure. Thank you. Charlton Brighton. Yeah, I was, I'd like to ask a question uh, regarding solar installations. Um, looking a little bit more to the future, the province has made this net zero commitment, uh, depending on whether you speak Catch. about energy or in general, it's from seven years or 17 years away. Why are you financing solar installations um, uh, directly as a capital cost instead of as a revenue generating installation like you do with the windmills through the energy corporation? Uh, the reason I'm asking this is that if you, obviously if you're putting collectors on all public buildings, you would speak about tens and tens of millions of dollars where you're going to get the money from, whereas you could finance it off budget through the energy corporation. And you somehow seem not to consider that. Can you tell me why not? Um, in, with, with the particular size, I think, of this installation, um, for the energy corp to consider it, um, they, they have to have a return on, on investment. Um, so I think they're, we, we, they're looking at it through the Energy Corp on a larger scale. I think there's a project at Slemon Park, some solar panels and some battery storage and, and um, as, a, as a project for the Energy Corp. Um, again, this being a, a, a pilot, I think if there is a, a large scale and, and a revenue opportunity, I, I suspect that the Energy Corp could be looking at it. Um, but again, it's in installing, and they're on our own buildings for sure, but uh, the Energy Corp has to own the assets. And, and uh, I think that being a pilot project, was we were going to try it out first to see how, how it was going to work. And if there's some applications there, I suspect they'll be going down that road in a larger scale. Charlottetown and Brighton. Well, thanks for your answer. And I, I guess what I'm saying, you could look at the financing method as a pilot issue as well. Um, on, down on the electric charging stations, it, that's a very large amount. Is that for the buses or is that for the other cars or, or for the public? Um, no, the, the, these would be public installations at uh, locations across um, across the island, not for, not for the buses. The bus kind of charging infrastructure comes with the bus purchases in, in the Department of Education. So, Charlottetown, Brighton. So how many stations do you uh, get for that amount? Um, I think they're looking at 16 locations. 16, yeah. Charlottetown, Brighton. Okay, thank you. That's, that, that's a, an expensive station. Okay. All right, oh, good. Charlottetown, West Royalty. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so yeah, the electric vehicle charging stations, you, get, you have 16 locations. Um, 
So that's a that's a big jump. Can you tell me where about they're going to be? Are they all over the island or a, a breakdown by year and location? Because it's a five-year capital budget, correct? Yeah. So. Yeah, it's um, this, this particular um, initiative is just over two years, so it's 23, 24, and 24, 25. So this will get wrapped up uh, a little quicker than than five years. Um, now this is there is some negotiations because they're going in, in public places for for leasing, and they have to get approved to put this the, these in. But I think they're they were talking about um, um, some 200 kilowatt plus chargers for Charlottetown and Summerside, one each. Um, some 199, 100 to 199 in the Brackley, Hunter River, Montague, Mount Pleasant, North Rustico, Scotchford, St. Peter's and Tignish. And then some of the smaller, the 50 to 99 in Bell River, Borden, Charlottetown, O'Leary, Summerside and Surrey. Charlottetown, what's royalty? And, and is this done by demand? Uh, is this where you're finding that, that we need? The the them installed or how, how how do you come to these these communities? I think we, we, we discussed in, in the past that there are a number privately set up and I think there's a, a little bit of a grid map being developed by the department as to uh, where to get from place to place a, a strategic location would be. Charlottetown, what's royalty? So, two million six hundred dollars. But now, now we find out it's a five-year capital budget, but this is a two-year commitment. Is it? Is this? Well, it seems. It seems. It seems a little bit odd that you wouldn't look at the next three years after that. What? What? Why was? What's going on there? Is this? Is there federal money in this? Federal offset. There is federal offset. Yeah, that's for sure. But we want to take advantage of. Charlottetown sure, West Royalty. Okay, so how much is the federal contribution for, for that? Same same values we have in the budget. Oh, so this isn't provincial money. This is federal money. It's absolutely provincial spending offset <laughs> by federal government. Cheryl, how much royalty? Okay, well, it's good. It's good. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad we uh, found this out. So my, it's 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 good to have those charging stations up. And I mean, it's it's uh, glad that you're able to spend the money because yeah. I, I need to clarify. I'm just kind of scanning my notes here. Um, the the total project costs over the, the lifetime, I think, are expected to be um, 2.7. I think we have some in the current year, um, just a little bit in the current year. Um, so it's 2.7 in next year's budget, 880 in the second year. So about 3.6 total, um, and the federal offsetting revenue is only 1.4. So we do definitely have some provincial funds in this. Okay. Sure. So that's, royalty. that's good to take advantage of that. Yeah. That so it's uh, um, great to see those and, and vehicles. You have you have uh, five hundred and forty thousand dollars for for vehicles. Um, is that for five? Is that for five years? Two years? What what do we? And how many vehicles will that purchase? And who's getting them? Um, there is a couple of vehicles being acquired for the two billion tree program to. Um, Kind of get the Frank was a kind of expansion of the Frank Woody Nursery from last year. There's two billion bee tree program, so there's some uh, vehicles required for there, and there's some forest firefighting equipment in that number as well. Charlottetown West Royalty. Okay, so these aren't electric vehicles. Um, they're going to try to get electric vehicles um, or hybrids. Okay, as perfect. They, as they can. Charlottetown West Royalty. Yeah, I, I, I was okay. So that's that's uh, addition to. So that'll be. Will that be happening this year? Will that the 540 is for 23-24. So okay, this budget year. That's, that's the Charlottetown West Royalty. Okay, and I'll I'll save some other questions for the next section, Chair. Thank okay. you. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you. Well, I was glad to see the investment ramp up, but like. Um, Charlottetown West Royalty. I'm also surprised that the investment seems to cut off after two years. Do we believe that we will have the amount of chargers in place that we need after two years? Is that why there's no plan for additional spending in the five-year plan on this? Again, we're we're trying to supplement what's going on in the private sector as well, and there are a number of locations that uh, that are putting up the vehicle charging stations as well. So I think they're they're conscious that. A, a, an appropriate level of rollout uh, is, is where we're at with the number of vehicles we have, and I suspect as they 
kind of rolled out more and more vehicles, more locations will, will be required. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. There's also a line in the Transportation and Infrastructure Budget for charging stations also. I think it's like $150,000. Yeah. What's the difference between these two lines? Um, the ones for at Department of Transportation would be at government sites, so where we own um, the, the charging infrastructure and the location that it's installed in. These would be more community sites where are open for everyone. Thank you, Chair. So these ones in this line item are going to be in public spaces. Are they owned by government? Uh, they'll be owned by government, but some lease lease arrangement to have them on a property, private property. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. I'm just curious if there's operational expenses associated with maintaining and operating these. Uh, that's a good question. I do not know that. You can let me know. <laughs> Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. Some of the older level two chargers that were installed by, I want to say, Sun Country around are starting to break down. We're hearing that from a number of people. Um, I'm curious if the province has looked at taking over the maintenance of these or if you're planning to replace them. I mean, as some of these older systems start to break down, we do have to have a, a plan on what to do with that. The first ones didn't, for sure. Yeah. Um, I'll have to bring that back. I don't know the operational side of that particular initiative. Summerside Wilmot. Fair enough. So, moving over to vehicles. I have raised this every year that we have done capital budgets, but what is the reason that we have so many trucks for government members who don't use trucks for their jobs? I mean, you have to approve every expense that comes through. I guess this is a question for the finance minister specifically. But all of the ministers have vehicles. None of the ministers require trucks for their work. <coughs> I'm curious why you approve vehicle expenses for There's vehicles that are clearly larger than anyone needs. Chair. I've raised this every year. It's not new. Chair. I mean, for this specific uh, line item, it's, it's, a, on the list. it's actually for a, you, you can't intervene. I don't even know what this is, a, a muskeg truck that, that we're purchasing, and there's two forest fire trucks and these two line items. So I don't know if this field, this line item approach is, is, is for the, that use. I don't, I, and I do not know what a muskeg truck is. Forest fire. Has equipment around in okay. the woods. There you go. Nice <laughs> boy. Summerside Wilma. City boy. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I'm not sure that's an answer to the question, yeah. so I'm going to ask again on why we continue to approve expenses for ministers to use trucks that are significantly larger than are necessary for them to carry out their functions with government. Why would the Minister of Finance approve that kind of spending? Uh, I think you'll find over the last few months, actually, much, many of the members have, have de certainly downsized their vehicles um, with response to costs and, and so on and so forth. So that would be my answer, that there's been a lot of changing, changing of the fleet over the last couple, couple of years, for sure. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. On that question, how many trucks do ministers still have in our fleet <laughs> now that we're downsizing? I'm not aware of this. I don't know. One? Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. Uh, do we have a, an answer on that? I don't have an, an exact answer yeah. on that. I'd have to go and get the inventory of current assets within the fleet. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. I am curious if we are committed to purchasing all zero emission vehicles moving forward. Um, I think the, the, the commitment by for, for government is, is to get as many zero emission vehicles as we can get our hands on. Um, there is definitely a, um, a supply issue for electric vehicles, and there are still some applications um, where uh, there are requirements for larger vehicles where there are not very many electric options available yet. Uh, crew cab trucks and kind of one and three quarter ton trucks where they're, they're using it for you know, hauling um, Kind of equipment around and then tools like that. So uh, you know, I, th I think government is cautious, conscious of uh, the electric options that are available and, and trying to get them through um, as many as we can. 
Yeah, I'll remember. Just a reminder. I haven't done this yet, this session, but just a reminder um, from sessions previous. Um, just for Hansard, we want to ensure that all your words are printed correctly. So in order to do that, they have to hear exactly what you're saying. So if you could either speak up or speak directly into your microphones, it would be greatly appreciated. Uh, Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. I can certainly appreciate that there are certainly some positions in government uh, that would require a truck. Hauling around equipment, like you said, makes a lot more sense than a bike, for example. Hauling around a bike is probably not something you need a truck for. I'm just going to say that. But curious, another thing that you had indicated was that – oh, I should ask about that while we're here. Was that $500 trailer hitch ever repaid? Uh, that's not part of the capital budget. Oh, right. That's yeah. an operational yeah. question yeah. I stand Summer correctly. side, Wilmot, you have the floor. We can save that one for question period. Thank you, Chair. Another thing that you had asked or that you had indicated that I just want to circle back to is that there are a couple of vehicles that needed to be purchased for the two billion tree program. So I'm wondering if you can help me understand that. Vehicles for tree planting. Um, I don't know the specifics of. I know they grow them out at the Frank Woody Nursery, but they have to go places as well. So I suspect they're for the transport of the trees once they get to a certain size to be planted. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. I, I suppose what I don't understand about that is the Frank J. Uh, Goody. Goody. Goody Nursery has been growing trees and providing mm -hmm. them for watershed groups yeah. and government and organizations for ages. Um, just, I just am not clear on what we would need more vehicles, yeah. more vehicles to reach our two yeah. billion. It feels a bit ironic. Well, there, there was a significant <laughs> expansion out there of more greenhouses added to reach the two billion tree program. So, I suspect it's a, a numbers, more trees, more greenhouses. More people, more trucks. More trucks. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. Now, um, there is a commitment to get electric hybrid vehicles where possible for this particular application. I appreciate that. On the corporate land use information, can you remind me what this spending is providing for again? I haven't been responsible for this file in a while. Um, yeah, the, the Forest Remanagement Act requires an inventory every 10 years. Um, so there was some flyovers, aerial photography, sort of a database of information that would be uh, required. Um, um, I say aerial photos and LIDAR flights were completed in 2020 to get an inventory and an application um, together. So that becomes a point in time, reference point for what the land looks like at that point in time. Summer said Wilma. Thank you, Chair. Is that the State of the Forest report? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you for that. So I was going to ask why that spending drops off, but the State of the Forest report is only every 10 years, so that Correct. answers my question. On the um, Frank Goody Nursery expansion, can you give me a summary of where that project is at? Uh, what are some of the main changes that they have been able to yeah. make? The, the, the work is expected to be completed this year, so that's why there's no there's only vehicles in, in for, for next year. Um, they purchased equipment um, and erected three greenhouses on the Upton Road site. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. I'm curious. I know that we are relying on tree planting as a significant portion of our carbon capture plan for the province. Do we think that the greenhouses are now at the point that we need them to be to produce the amount of trees that the province is relying on us getting in the ground every year to meet our carbon reduction targets? Um, I don't know specifically, but they didn't ask for a second expansion at the Frank Goody Nursery, so I suspect they're, they're where they need to be at this point in time. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. I'm good for this. Charlotte Ann Brighton. No, I just had a couple more question on charging stations, uh, which of course is a great thing. Um, is, what is 
the uh, person who wants to charge his car, what do they pay? Do they pay the actual cost of the electricity, or is it free, or is it uh, charged to, with a profit in mind? Uh, I don't have any information on the operational side of the program. This, the information I have is related to the capital cost of installing the actual chargers. Sheriff Tom Brighton. And the other point was that it seems to be certain businesses would uh, would find it very attractive to have chargers in front of them, like a, a high-end restaurant or would, for instance, obviously love every Tesla in town to park and charge in front. Uh, do you go and seek positions that might even contribute to the cost of the chargers? Uh, are you looking for places where they want the chargers, not just where you want to put them? And are you considering uh, looking for contribution to, uh, towards the charger to get more of them? Um, for, for this particular program, I, I don't believe so. This was a federal, a federal government program that we signed on to. Um, so we were able to get uh, some installed, and I think there's a grant portion of it as well that allows for businesses and multi-unit residential locations to acquire um, charging infrastructure as well. So it was a two-sided two approach to it. Okay. Shall uh, Thank you, Chair. Shall a section carry? Oh. Or Charlton yeah. West Royalty, do you have a question? Well, yeah, I was going to be on. I didn't know if you were going to call capital. No, I didn't call. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'll... So that carried. Capital improvements. Appropriations provided for capital improvements. The J. Frank Goody Nursery expansion. Total capital improvements. Do we have any questions on this section? Charlottetown, West Royalty. Yeah. So I mean, uh, my colleague uh, asked a, a few questions there, and, and it was good to see those. Uh, greenhouses. No, it's, it's good to see those greenhouses up and operational. My question is, I know that the province, when they were putting together the capital budget, um, made a few changes into it at the, at the last minute because of Fiona. Um, was there any thought about, we, we lost um, half of our, some people might say half of our softwood um, capacity. It, was there any, was there anything decided to to look maybe at this line and say, hey, you know what, we might invest some more money into this line after these three greenhouses went up? Um, as you can appreciate, the, the process for preparing the capital budget doesn't happen quickly. Um, it does take a number of months, so um, the actual storm happened right in the middle of, or at the tail end, I should say, of the preparation of this. Um, I know that there are a few programs that were, were added uh, as a direct result of some of the uh, work that we see being required. Um, I suspect that there will be a, uh, you know, a, a report and some soul searching done after the event is finally mopped up and, and people try to get back to uh, their normal lives and, and, and see how and what we need to do better. And, and if this is one of those spots, I think uh, it would be there. Mm -hmm. Cheryl, tell us what's wrong Yeah, and I'm glad we're having this discussion because I don't really have too many questions because it would be more technical questions, but we need to to kind of look at this. And I know this was for a specific project, but we're gonna th that that area produces hundreds of thousands of tr trees that we we will need to invest in in Prince Edward Island and, and smartly. So um, I just wanted to draw that uh, draw that to the forefront. So that's all I have. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Total capital expenditure, environment, energy, and climate action, five million twenty-two thousand one hundred. Shall it carry? Carry. And now moving on to page thirteen, capital expenditure finance, twenty-three, uh, the twenty twenty-three twenty twenty-four budget estimate for equipment, appropriations provided for information technology purchases and system modernization, hardware and storage, six million three hundred eight thousand six hundred. IT system modernization, 7,263,700. Total equipment, 13,572,300. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. Uh, could you summarize what, what is included in uh, our investment for hardware and storage? Um, for hardware and storage, um, we have a couple of um, uh, 
server banks um, at the QEH and at the, um, the Sullivan Building, um, and they kind of run the government network. And there is a regular um, refresh of that server technology. Um, we have also kind of gone to a part where we're, we have some in, in the cloud that they're virtual servers, so um, they're constantly updating and refreshing the equipment that's required to support the applications and services. Um, in this as well, we would have uh, data centers in every government building that has switches and, and things like that, so it's all part of the actual backbone of the government network that gets updated and refreshed on, on, a, on a regular basis. Leader of the opposition. Thanks, Chair. So there's a close to a two, well, 2.2 million jump from last year's estimate to the forecast, and I'm wondering what, why, what explains that? Um, I guess the, the best explanation has been supply chain. Um, mm -hmm. The microchips that, that are within the server technology have been uh, tough, tough to get, and when we've been on kind of a back order from the previous year, and and it was uh, some of the orders didn't come in the, from the previous year, so the, the forecast is up a little bit for this year. Leader of the opposition. So just so I'm clear on that, uh, Gordon, uh, so the increased cost there is not that we're buying 50% more stuff, but the cost has gone up 50% in one year? No, we'd be getting more stuff. So there, there was, we had hoped to get, I know at March of 22, there was supposed to be an order come in, and if it doesn't land by the end of March, it okay. can't be counted in I, that I particular understand. year, okay. so you end up with, um, and that's the, the disadvantage of, of having a kind of a one-year and a five-year snapshot. You, you can kind of lose the past history as well, um, and for these items, we're looking at a constant re recycling and, and refreshing uh, of the investments, and sometimes the, the cash flow is a little lumpy. Leader of the Opposition. Yeah, I, I appreciate that answer, Gordon. It helps me understand it for sure. We had a big change within government in the last 12 months when we moved to Microsoft 365, and I'm wondering where where we are with that. You know, has that is that now complete across government, and did it go as planned in terms of exp capital expenses? Um, de definitely it wasn't as quick as they would have liked, for sure. Um, COVID was a little bit of an issue in, in getting out and, and getting all the work done. Um, and then um, the actual, we end up, we have about three networks. We run a health, education, and core government. So they were doing it on a phased approach. So the core government went fair, fairly quickly. Uh, education was next. And I believe that they're at health care right now, um, tying up the rest of the users. Right. Leader of the opposition. So on that, the issue of healthcare. I mean, one of the things which has been in the works for <laughs> as long as I've been in this house is the move towards electronic health records. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering where, again, a general question. And I realise that you know, the minister can't answer this question today. But where are we in terms of that, specifically related to investments in capital? Um. I guess it's it's twofold within this section. Um, ITSS and Finance Department of Finance are looking at the um, user portal, the My PEI side. So that would be the identification that that makes me an individual, so that I can go in and deal with government on a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so they're working on the front end of the system through ITSS. Um, health and Health PEI are working on the actual data systems for all the, the supports that they, they do, whether it be the EMR, the lab system, the Cerner system. So this uh, finance is working on, like I say, the user portal that would identify individuals so that they can go in and then access some of those records. So they're kind of working on both ends. The back end at the hospital when the clinicians need it, and then the front end for the people to access it. Right. Leader of the opposition. So the software that runs that program, so does that get, um, is that booked as a capital expense? Uh, a little bit of both. Um, definitely if we can identify um, time and effort and equipment to go in to build a system that you can point to that has future value, then it is a capital system. Um, if it's training and upgrading, and it's not. It would be an operating. Okay. But for the most part, we're trying to um, 
I guess the, if, if we're developing it ourselves, the, the time that staff take to kind of write the code and get it up and running can be capitalized if there's a something at the end of the day that you could point to that has future value. Right. Sure. Leader of the opposition. Thanks, Chair. And, and one example of that would be a fully integrated functional across the whole healthcare system uh, electronic record system. And that in other jurisdictions where they have built such a system, uh, as I understand it, and having had conversations with IT people from those jurisdictions, getting it right up front is really important. Like you can spend a lot more money on trying to make things talk happily to each other down the road rather than getting it, you know, getting a system which is compatible across the, the whole of government up front. And I'm wondering, again, where we are with that. Like, uh, uh, have we chosen the system that we're going to use and the existing electronic health records? And I realize it's not, you know, we were just getting going on this, really, even though it was meant to be rolled out many years ago. Um, where are we with that? Um, for sure, the EMR is, has been selected, and it's a, I think it's a TELUS-based system that's been okay. in, in the works for hmm. many other jurisdictions. Um, the hospital-based systems are Cerner-based systems. Um, the MyPEI portal, uh, we're working with some developers and some in-house staff to kind of look at what um, that front end looks like. So I think it's more of a, a made-in-PEI solution. Okay. Leader of the Opposition. And just for my own comfort, perhaps, Gordon, are the, the Cerner and TELUS systems completely compatible? Um, the, that's part of the, the work plan, is, is to write the interfaces between any system that is not um, sort of proprietary. So for sure, if you're working with TELUS, all there, they work on their own proprietary side. Uh, Cerner has its own um, set of code, and then there is middleware and interfaces that get developed to make sure that there's an efficient flow of information. Okay. Leader of the opposition. And, and that's where I get nervous, because that's where things can balloon in terms of capital costs and, and time related to that. So in other jurisdictions where we have, uh, is there another jurisdiction, maybe I should start there, that has both Cerner and TELUS in place and, and can teach us whether that this is a good way to go? Uh, I, I don't know that, that answer. Um, I'd have to bring that back. Okay, I will you mark that down for GP. <laughs> sure, you have the floor. Uh, okay, yep. great, thank you. Um, so we have, uh, in government, of course, where I was talking about the health care, uh, health and wellness department there, but there are other entities and some of them operate at arm's length from government, things like um, Iraq, Crown Corps, stuff like that. So does the capital expense, which is logged here in, our, in, in the budget book, does that support those uh, um, parts of government that are arm's length or, or do they have their own budgets for that? Um, for the most part, like we, we run uh, the Oracle financial information system that is used by, by many entities that would be part of this capital budget. Um, you get into some of the crowns, they may have smaller applications that, um, that they would be uh, dealing with. We saw an example of Tourism PEI was getting a new reservation system, so we, it's part of the capital budget. So. Okay. Leader of the Opposition. Right. And the RIM, the Record Information Management System, would that, would, does that fall under this, un, under finance as well? Uh, it would be by, um, through ITSS, yes. Right. Yeah. So we just released a three-year strategy for that um, in 2021. And I'm wondering whether these investments are um, part of that three-year strategy, at least part of the investments we're looking at here? Um, yes, that would be one of the corporate systems that would be, would be part of the application systems. So within the investment in this, there's, there's a corporate system in several um, departments that uh, would be, and records would be one of them. Leader of the Opposition. So I mean, if you look at that three-year strategy, the year one goal, I'm, I'm going to quote it here, adopt and begin implementation of electronic document and records management systems to effectively manage electronic government records, including email. So I'm wondering how much progress we've made, by, like we're at, at the end of the first year. Yeah, uh, I don't have any information there. I'd have to bring that back. Leader of the Opposition. Okay. Um, in the IT system modernization, uh, that's the $7 million line for this year's budget estimate. Um, 
in that line, we're seeing government um, come in. At, if I look back at last year's budget estimate and forecast, uh, over a million dollars less than was budgeted last year. So can you explain what happened there, please, Gordon? Um, yeah, I don't have the specifics here. I'd have to get a project by project. I have them in kind of big buckets like you have there. Right. Um, so I'd have to be specific as to which particular initiative didn't kind of get to where they had hoped to get to. The Leader of the Opposition. So is that the likely explanation then that we didn't, like, the shift over to Microsoft 365, for example, came in under budget, or is it just some work was yeah, not for, done? Yeah, for sure. That that was about 900,000 of it, for sure. Um, they, they, get to, they, were, they got to a phase of the project that they last year estimated it might be capital, and it got into the training and kind of user, um, working with users that was determined not quite to be a capital definition, so kind of got transitioned, and that's transition to the operating budget. So that's the other part. As we get the system built, often there's annual operating costs that go right. with it, license fees and things yep. like that, um, that get transitioned out. And as long as it's a capital project and you're still building it, you can capitalize it, but the day that you turn it on and it do substantial completion, you kind of take the capitalization ability away from you and it turns into an operating expense. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks. Um, a few years ago, we were, uh, the province got hacked by malware and caused all kinds of problems. Um, are any of the system modernizations part of protecting what we have to Try and I mean I realize there's no bulletproof way of stopping that, but is that an ongoing expense? Um, absolutely. That that's kind of throughout. Whether it be our hardware updates and our system updates to try to keep them patched and secured, uh, working with every day. Uh, there was during the the event itself. There was a number of systems that were identified that were sort of not up to today's standards that had to be replaced. So. Um, those were kind of prioritized. Uh, one of the ones, I think it's the land registry system or the geo link system or one of those taxation-based kind of user where you can go and get the maps and things like that off, off the government website. So it wasn't kind of up to the code behind it wasn't compatible with new technology. So they had to physically kind of come up with a new way of doing that uh, particular service. Leader of the Opposition. And I remember having a discussion prior to us moving over to Microsoft 365 about the relative safety of it. And if I remember right, the part of the rationale for making that move was that it would make our system more stable and less likely to be endangered by stuff like that. Is that, is that correct? Uh, that would be a fair assumption. Um, not that the, the Novell system that we had uh, wasn't a good system at the time. It's just um, it had there's not as many people using it, so there wasn't as many updates. So they weren't keeping pace mm -hmm. where Microsoft is keeping pace, and they're on the front end of of, uh, of the of the technology. Right. Leader of the opposition. Thanks. Um, in the capital briefing that we had a, a few days ago, Minister, there was reference made to uh, services either being made available online or easier to access online, and I'm wondering if you could elaborate on what those improvements are going to be. And Geolink was one of them, actually, Gordon, if I remember right. It's, it's mostly about the infrastructure around security to, to, to protect identity and all that type of stuff. So again, the base, the base services before we deliver certain aspects. So that, that has been the focus, is to ensure that if we proceed down that my PEI pathway, that the, that the security in the back end is there first before we determine what services to, to, to allow the public to do themselves or to access themselves. Leader of the Opposition. So in, in doing that, Minister, will that may indeed make other th things that are perhaps not easy or possible to access online, will that facilitate that in the future? I certainly hope so. I certainly hope so. Again, that, that would be the goal of any service is to allow the public to, to, to service themselves, so to speak. That, that would be the ultimate goal, obviously, of, of any system like that, is to, to allow that 24-7 access to particulars that they require. The Leader of the Opposition. And, I mean, a few of us got very excited. I'm not much of a techie guy, but I know a few in my 
caucus are, and, and uh, they got quite excited about the prospect of enhancing open data uh, through a, through the government portal. And I'm wondering, that doesn't seem to me like it really went very far. There were a couple of little things that happened early on, and some departments moved some of their data to a place where it could be easily accessed. But I don't see a, a big sort of wave of open data being available so that islanders can sort of, in, if your goal is to be open and transparent, that's a wonderful way of allowing islanders to see what's happening inside government. So where where is that project? I mean, I guess the, the short comment is, is you have to be cautious when, and, you know, when proceeding with that type of project, you know, again, back to security that issues that we face every day and in, in any IT infrastructure so I think they have a cautious approach to 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 this project um, so I think that's the best way to approach it is that that we go we tread really slowly and that we ensure that you know that, that we have a secure system and that you know obviously public data or everything like that it's a serious issue so we, we have to be I think we have to err on the side of caution so and again these things do take time you know there, there's a lot um, even the geolink issue again was was a long time coming, and we had to we had to addition, we had to address it due to security. And even the book PEI issue, uh, again, we're kind of taking a, a backwards approach to those to those programs. But eventually, the, the maintenance and security is is paramount to to developing any system like that. Leader of the opposition, right? So just so I'm clear, Minister, the the one of the reasons, perhaps, or the principal reason, since it was all you mentioned, that open data is not moving faster or being more available to islanders is because of a potential security threat with making that data available? I wouldn't necessarily agree with that, but I think we need just, just need to be cautious of how we proceed into this realm. We're, we're not Revenue Canada, so to speak, that deal with and have the, the, the infrastructure and the technology and the staff to to manage large data sets, so I, th I think we need to be cautious, but, you know, it's something, again, if we can improve service to Islanders, we need to look at it, obviously, and, and people expect it, for sure. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks. And you, you brought up CRA there, and um, one of the areas where technology has not really facilitated the speed or ease of getting money to Islanders, we've seen that a couple of times in the, in the inflation rebates which were announced a long time ago and now uh, with the most recent um, giving Islanders money back it's going to be three months before they get that because we're doing it through CRA. Are you aware of other jurisdictions that have built software that they themselves can operate and control and that would allow us not to depend on another level of government or another organization to get that money out, rather that we have a database where we can facilitate the fast and safe delivery of government money to islanders should we ever need to do that again. So twice in the last year we've been really handcuffed by that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Again, uh, you know, Revenue Canada have the resources, there's access to you know, banking information, or, you know, SIN, tax data and stuff like that. So the sensitivity of that data can't be overemphasized and, and how we have to protect it and we you know initially we don't compile again we don't compile or that's why we have the CRA to, to process a, you know our taxes for on behalf of the provinces so that they have the infrastructure to do it to do it so you know it's it's the security implications on having access to banking information and and personal data it's it's a serious issue and it's it's a it's something that, again, they have the expertise and, and you know, that they, they, they have the resources in order to manage it as well. Leader of the Opposition. Yeah, and I, of course I understand the, yeah. the vulnerabilities and the precarity of, of dealing with this sort of thing. And I guess my question, and I rambled on a bit afterwards, and I apologize for that, so I'm going to make my, this question short, which is what, what I failed to do last time. Have you looked at other jurisdictions that have implemented something like this that, that they could control? At a provincial level, um, I, I believe 
we we are going down that road. Um, there is some some funding in this particular budget to look at a payment system for PEI. Uh, not similar, like Newfoundland, I think, did roll something out individually to to their <coughs> residents. Um, we definitely uh, struggled with the the size and the number of, of people that would be required to receive this payment. Um, you know, a CRA does have the capacity right now because they deal with our taxpayers um, annually through the receipt of their information and, 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 and do run a number of programs for us, whether it be the low-income payments to Islanders, they, they run the, the um, HST and the GST, the HST rebates. Um, so we're, we're actually looking at um, developing an agreement with um, CRA to get our information to us so that we can run an adjudication system and, and a benefit payment system for us. But that will take some time because um, we do have to receive sort of the run of information and, and it's really demographic style information and how do we use it, so how many people are in a household, what's the address, can we use their banking, get permissions and things like that from, because uh, when I make application to CRA, I've provided all this information for them to use. It didn't necessarily provide it to CRA for the province to use. So th there is some work that is required and, and, and there is some money in this budget to, uh, to commence uh, a benefit payment system uh, for our owners. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I, uh, I, I agree, Gordon. It, it obviously would be a, a pretty significant investment in both time and money in order to create our own database where we could, rather than go through CRA or Red Cross or, or some other third party, to distribute this money where, that we could do that in-house with, you know, maybe not quite the click of a button, but you know what I'm talking about here. Yeah. But I'm, again, looking at the frustrations that government must have felt in, in not being able to get this money out to islanders when they needed it and wondering whether there has been any sort of cost um, attached to the, the potential development of such a system. Again, I am aware of other jurisdictions that have the ability to do this, not su substantially larger than Prince Edward Island, and it strikes me that that would be a really welcome investment of government funds and time um, in order to create a database that would be able to get money out more quickly and more efficiently to islanders at a time of need. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks. You know what? I think I'll, I, I'm, uh, I'm exhausted. Chair, I've exhausted my questions. 24 questions. questions. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah, okay. good run. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Any further questions on this section? Total capital expenditure finance, 13572300 Shall I carry? Page 15, Capital Expenditure Fisheries and Communities 2023-2024, Budget Estimate Equipment. Appropriations provided for equipment purchases, equipment 25,000, total equipment 25,000. Any questions? Shall I carry? Total Capital Expenditure Fisheries and Communities 25,000. Shall I carry? Page 17, Capital Expenditure Health and Wellness, 2023-2024 Budget Estimate Equipment, Appropriations Provided for Information Technology Purchases and System Modernization, IT System Modernization, $1,250,500, Total Equipment $1,250,500. Shall the section carry? <laughs> Any questions? Anybody? Okay, O'Leary and Vernesse? Can you provide us a little more specifics on what the IT system modernization is actually? Is this the EMR issue or what are you trying to resolve here? Because it seems like there's been lots of problems with that. Yeah, I think there were some notes went out last week on specific sections for health and wellness. Were they not tabled last week? Mm, well, Paul Ari and Vernes? Uh, I didn't, I don't know, well, maybe that, I got them here somewhere, but oh wait yeah. now. It was tabled last week, but uh, so I mean I, I can speak to it, but um, there too. But do, yeah, speak to them, please. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, no. This this was the uh, another phase of the EMR rollout. Uh, so this is a community pharmacy kind of portal um, to allow um, the prescribers, um, sorry, the pharmacists to access information 
back on the, per, the patient's medical record to uh, help them with the Pharmacy Plus system and, and roll out of the additional um, refills that were going to be able to be made at the uh, at the pharmacy level. Well, there you are Is this also a, a, a system that's going to allow them to bill government directly uh, with this system here too, or uh, the is that separate totally? Yeah, pharmacies already have an ability to bill government through through the pharmacy system. So um, every prescription that gets <coughs> filled in PEI is is vetted through the the government database for all kinds of things. You know, duplicates on medication and. And then there's a payment module that, that is associated as, with it as well. All area in Vernas. Okay, that's thanks, Chair. <coughs> Any further questions? Yes. Okay, does <coughs> somebody has to indicate I'm to me, though. So sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, so Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. So this is mostly on the EMRs. I'm just curious if the does this mean that the EMRs are ready to be implemented entirely across the province? Um, I'm not sure where the operational phase of that is. I know that it got so far and there were um, some questions that had come up with some of the providers that they were working through on the first phase of the rollout of the EMR. Um, I'll have to go get some specifics for you. Thank you, Chair. I'm curious if this budget puts us in a position to get EMRs rolled out to all health centres across the island. Uh, this particular run of this budget would be more focused on the pharmacy partners. Um, the, the past kind of uh, investments in EMR would have been for uh, family for family doctors and, and, and clinic locations. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. The spending in this current fiscal year was more than $600,000 under budget. Why is that? Uh, Yeah. Yeah, that was, um, I'll have to get the specifics. It was related to um, phase two of the um, EMR, and that was the mental health and addictions community-based portion of the EMR. Mm -hmm. So I'll have to get the specifics as to why. Um, I suspect it was over budget the year before, but I, I can't comment specifically because I'll have to go get the information. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. I was wondering if the project is behind schedule. Uh, there's no additional funding for it in the next year, so that would indicate that it's concluded. So I suspect it's cash flow related more in the first year of a two-year project, but I will confirm for you. I think I'm good. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Any further questions? Yes, Chair. Is the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Chair. So looking at um, mental health facilities, so maybe that's in the next... Is that in this section? Uh, we're in the equipment. Uh, we're doing the part on the equipment, it's IT system modernization. Right, and capital improvements also? No, we didn't get to that. Oh, yet. you didn't get to just yeah. the equipment? Yeah. No, I just okay. read the first section. My apologies. Okay. So, um, no, I have no questions on equipment. I do on capital okay. improvements. Shall the section carry? Here. Capital improvements. Appropriations provided for, <coughs> provided for capital improvements, mental health and addictions facilities, $24,780,600. Total capital improvements, $24,780,600. Leader of the Opposition or Mermaid Stratford. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Um, so when we get to this section, the five-year budget um, for the new mental health campus just always seems to look the same with the bulk of the funding in the years to come. So can you give me a picture of what it actually will look like? Um, are we going to get going on it? And what does the, I guess, it's consistently been pushed back. So what does the realistic picture look like and what are we going to see in the next year happen with the mental health campus? Um, I think if, if you look between the years, I think we've kind of stabilized the project as to <coughs> kind of stabilized stabilized the kind of the, the timing of the project. Uh, the information that I have is that we are at the same place in the same schedule that would have been discussed last year um, within the house here. 
um, what has happened is, um, I'd say, a hardening or a strengthening or a, a deepening, for sure, of, of the uh, of the expenses expected um, as we're kind of got off our Class D estimate and, and have got a Class C estimate, which is one better than D. Um, they're getting closer to being able to uh, get to tender. They're at the planning stage now. They're in the architectural design phase of, mm -hmm. of, the, of the, the hospital itself. Um, and they have kind of started the additions to the uh, eMERGE room at the QEH, as, as was in the media there recently. Mm -hmm. Roommate Strafford. Thanks, Chair. So it, what what is included in the $8.8 .8 million that's in the current fiscal year? Is that the piece onto the QEH, or is that something different? A absolutely. That that would be um, some of the planning that's underway. So we would be have architectural services and project management services <coughs> being funded through that. We'd have some construction at the QEH for the, 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 the piece that's going on there. Permit okay. Stratford. Thanks. Um, thanks, Chair. So when do you expect that to go out to tender? The, and that's I'm the Hillsborough Hospital. I'm just in your notes there. Um, they expect the construction tender process to begin in October of 23. So soon. Mermaid Strafford. Thanks, Chair. So sorry, tender process in October 2023? 23. Yeah, they're in the design phase right now, so they'll get out to a construction tender uh, for October 23. Okay. Mermaid Strafford. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. And then you've got a big jump um, in spending of $24.7 million. Yep. So can you list the projects that are part of that $24.7 million? Uh, majority of that would be the construction of the actual hospital. Mermaid Strafford. Thanks, Chair. So when do you expect that tender to close and it to be awarded and shells in the ground? <laughs> Just curious. Uh, October of 23. Um, that's, so they're in the design phase right now. Um, the, the tenders, you know, it, it'll be a big, a big process, um, but the, there's a project management team kind of on site and, and, and working there every day. So, um, you know, as fast as they can get through them, they... They'll, they'll have them, uh, but the schedule, as, as I've been aware, is the same as we, we talked about here last year. No, no more kind of delays. It's business. It's it's business and planning. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And at this current pace, when is it expected that the hospital will actually be open and ready to go? Um, yeah, I believe in, in your notes there. It's, it's a, the substantial completion around. The end of 26. So. Okay. Mermaid Strafford. Thanks, Chair. Um, so, Lacey and the community facility, um, are those completed now? Um, I get mixed up when you talk about specific locations okay. and names. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, um, so, Lacey House is in on that campus. Yeah. And then there, I think it's the transitional. Um, unit that's there yep. or the structured housing is what it's referred to yeah um, uh, and there was supposed to be a third um, third building on that property uh, yes I, I don't remember the name of it but it was not the hospital An that ALC it was residential to. facility what sorry what is An it ALC ALC residential facility and it's in the notes there as well it's it's going to be going kind of concurrently with with the hospital and uh, scheduled for a 25 substantial completion, so a year before the hospital. Okay. Mermaid Strafford. All right, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, so the mental health hospital is going to start 2023-2024, looking to finish 2026. Um, is this expedited by, is, is it an expedited build that your government promised? Like, so, I mean, during the election, one of the campaign promises was Hillsborough Hospital. So, um, is this behind um, what you would have originally have been budgeting it to be delivered? Or was this always the intended date? Since I've been sitting in this chair, these have been the dates that uh, based on the cash flows and, and the project status. Mermaid Strafford. Okay, thanks, Chair. So when 
it was stated shovels in the ground on day one, it was never actually possible to do that because I really in the capital budget it was always slated to be this far past the past the that time frame. I'd have to go back and research the actual capital budgets and the levels of funding that were associated with it. I know this is the, the biggest amount that's been in this capital budget for this project, so okay. it's been growing since over the last number of years. Okay. Mermaid Strafford. Thanks, Chair. Um, and so there's talk about substantial completion. I believe that's in the notes. And then, so can you just elaborate on what substantial completion means? Um, and is there certain portions of the hospital that won't be ready to go um, on day one, or um, will it? I'm just looking for a definition of what you mean there. Um, again, I've stated I'm not an engineer, <laughs> and I'm not an architect, um, so I'll go with what I believe substantial completion to be, and that would be the majority of work by the contractors that we've engaged is done. Um, there is definitely a uh, transition from the current building to the new building that, that happens as well, but it's more of an operational in nature. So how do you kind of transfer and turnkey the, the services from one building to another? Um, I suspect that, that those plans w will come in due course, um, but substantially complete would be the contractor would be done of the work and paid for the work that they, they've been uh, asked to do. Mermaid Strafford. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you for that, Gord. Um, so I'm just now wondering about the net zero capacity within this build. Is that being considered on this to be, is it going to be a net zero building? Or, uh, sorry, I'm talking about, yeah, the mental health facility buildings and renovations or build to um, net zero. I, I, I believe that's been a commitment to have net zero ready builds. Um, I'll have to get the specifics for you as to what particulars are going into this building um, as far as kind of heating and, and cooling and things like that. So I'm, I'll have to get the specifics for you. Okay. Mermaid Strafford. Thanks, Chair. Um, so I would just want to talk about Detox Center, the, D, the uh, Provincial Addiction Treatment Facility in Mount Herbert. So that has about a three-week wait list for people to get a bed in there. Um, were there upgrades to the facility considered in the capital budget? Um, that building would be run by Health EI, so it's definitely not in this section, and not run by the Department of Health oh. and Wellness. Okay. Uh, Mermaid Strafford. So I hope somebody's watching to figure that out, because I'm not <laughs> sure if it's in the next section either. <laughs> okay. All right. And so just around other mental health um, capital upgrades, um, and, and what we can look at. So, for instance, like space at Unit 9 um, and what the capacity looks like there is probably also going to be in health PEI, is it? Yes. Okay. Mermaid Strafford. I think that's all the questions I have for this section. Thank Thanks. you. Char uh, Charles, how much royalty? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm just um, <coughs> the, the, the tendering, we started this conversation a few years ago, obviously, with uh, a lot of communication and shovels in the ground and such there had a certain number what 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 is the number now because we didn't take action on this we weren't ready for shovels in the ground how much how much more expensive is this project now than it was when it was first announced I wouldn't have a specific number for you as to what the effect of kind of uh, a hot economy and and and, and you know a very taxed building um, um, sort of contractors. Um, I suspect that that the size of this project will will attract um, some interest from from some larger players that we perhaps haven't seen in the past on on PEI. But uh, again, have to let the uh, tendering process kind of field its way out. Um, definitely, there has been, as I said, some. Inflationary pressures as a result of cost of materials and cost of, of time um, factored in, but um, I don't think we've put, kind of put a specific um, number to it. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to provide a budget that they see as sufficient. So I guess you did the math. We haven't changed what we're doing here. 
and we'd have to go back and do the math as to what the estimate was last year for it versus the estimate this year, and we'll only know once the thing gets built what the final number will be. Yeah. Shout out how much royalty? How much wiggle room do you have in that? Because we're seeing a lot of projects that, that are coming in huge amounts over, like, and you're talking about huge amounts here. Are, are we talking 10%? Are we talking 20? How, how, how what, are, what are we looking at initially? For sure, for sure. Um, you know, each project would maintain within the, the project budget a contingency for unforeseen circumstances, and it runs anywhere from five to eight percent on the size of the project. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the level of contingency they're, they're maintaining within this project, but um, if that was something that you're interested in, I could find out. Cheryl, how much royalty? Yeah, and this will be a big pro this will be a big project and I'm worried about that number. So you're you're as government you you look at that very diligently and and say that hey because this could be qu quite a bit more than we think it is. Yeah, the the sort of check-in points um, obviously are any time we have action. So, um, you know, there was the first building built on the site out there. It went through the process of engineered drawings, tendering for the construction, and um, and that kind of comes back to Treasury Board. And if budgets are above where the budgets were authorized by this house, then the special warrants are are sought. Um, I suspect the same will be for this as the activities are kind of entertained and completed. Yeah. Um, again, the budget is the best estimate based on the project team mm -hmm. um, in place today. Yeah. Um, and as soon as the, the book's folded up and put on the shelf, I'm sure there'll be better information mm -hmm. tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Mm -hmm. Charlton, what's royalty? And what I'm saying is that with a project this size, it's huge. You have to go all in on this. There's no, okay, we'll just do this part now. Once you get yeah. to this stage, we're, we're, we're all in on this. And I just asked questions today in the legislature about the partial hospitalization program. And we're down 21 beds for for uh, inpatient psychiatric care. But you hear you're adding 64. Um, that 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 doesn't in three years. I don't know where we're going to find the staff. I don't know. You know, I'm I'm just worried about I'm worried about a few things on this project. One is the, the the staffing levels that we have within health PEI cannot couldn't if this if this project was here right now we could not we could not staff it. And I'm just I'm just wondering, are you taking all these things into consideration and 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 what do we do to provide people? Islanders want access to service. Um, that's what I'm hearing over and over again. They need access to service. So what are we doing now to provide them access to service and is this the right route to take? Um, for the capital component, we're, we're build a bit, a building a building that we think will have the right services. Um, definitely, I think your questions are more of an operational in nature. Um, and better served at the operating budget time by officials of the Department of, of Health and Health PEI. Um, again, the, the project team has put forward uh, the capital uh, request that they see to build the facility to provide the services, and, and, and that's what we have in, in the budget here today. Sure, how much royalty? So the the uh, the the issues with with Unit Nine uh, being not there anymore and now it's a partial hospitalization program and now we have uh, Hillsborough moving to unit nine where do I find the numbers for those how, how did they come up with the numbers for those retrofits to those different facilities was that in last year's capital budget because I didn't see it uh, definitely any of the um, upgrades or um, retrofits that were done at uh, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital would be in Health PEI section, so um, oh, I'll try to get that. you there <laughs> sometime. Oh, good, good. Charlottetown, West Road. <clears throat> and I too, uh, uh, I too have a uh, issue with the word substantial completion. I know it's it's there twice on this page uh, for the addictions transition. It's substantial completion. Um, I, I too wonder what that would look like because the timelines here are off and. Uh, well, obviously the timeline for this project has been off for, for a very long time, so I'm wondering, like, how do we keep government accountable when we see substantial completion in two different 
two different places on one page here. Again, I think the two different places relates to the two different buildings out there. So, um, again, there will be a process for each one of them to um, kind of have it designed, have it tendered, have it constructed. Um, as you'd indicated, there, that's, there's a lot of variables between now and actually opening the doors. So uh, I think it's government's best estimate today as to when we expect the construction to be complete. And um, that's the information that, that we have. Cheryl Town West Royalty. And my last question is, why didn't we have this out to tender before October 2023? That's a full year away from now. Couldn't we have it in the spring? Couldn't we have it this October? I mean, I, I just, I, I don't understand it. We've had enough time to get this out to tender. Why, why is it coming forward a year from now? Um, I don't have all of the information for sure on the timeline for the project, but what, what I would offer is that, um, you know, it, it, it's it's a large building uh, and a complex building that, that requires uh, some detailed consideration from the space program and the, and the master plan um, to actually get a set of tender-ready documents um, so that somebody can go and bid on it. So that, that process, um, I, I know when we were talking about schools, it's about an eight-month process from the time we get an architect on site um, and ready to go. So. Um, this is bigger and more complicated than, than a school building for sure. So um, I know it seems long, but I think we we got to get it right, and, and we got to get uh, professionals on board to uh, to make sure that uh, we're we're building and what we uh, building what we need and, and, and what's what's uh, what's in the plan. Uh, as if we don't get it right, then you're into change orders and things like that. It's kind of adds a lot of costs to uh, to the project. Sure, that's not what That's good for me. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to touch on the 12 um, ALC care clients, so that under the Addictions Transition ALC Residential Facility. Um, there are 12, looks like there's 12 spaces. Is that going to be part of, of the mental health campus? And, sorry, that's part of the mental health campus. Yeah, I, I believe that that structure will be co-located on the campus. Chair. Mermaid Stratford. And so I'm just so I'm understanding is are these ALC is there a definition for um, who this would be so for instance is this um, people who are in hospital waiting for long-term care beds or just waiting to transition home do you have a definition on who will be I don't have anything here I'll have to bring something back okay, thanks. that specifically what the target audience is for the, that uh, facility. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And I mean, this is something that has been an ongoing discussion, like the number of beds at the QEH and PCH that are alternate level of care um, patients that are waiting to go elsewhere, So, but they can't move out of the hospital bed, so it has impacted patient flow. I'm just wondering how we came to the number of 12 and if we think that that's enough and what kind of work has been done around that to see if we're actually at the right number. Um, as I understand it, the, the, the whole project and, and the, the concept of the mental health campus was uh, part of a, a large review, uh, which would form, again, the, the master program and, and master plan for the service. So when you're doing that sort of process, you're looking over the long haul and in the long term as to what the needs are and, and develop and, and kind of establish the facilities that, that are needed at the end. And I suspect that this level of, of, of uh, beds was what was identified through that process. Mermaid Stratford. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, I would, yeah, I would just love to know who would qualify to be trans transferred into those beds. And then I'm curious about what's going to happen with Sherwood Home. So that is a facility that this might be under Health PEI, but I'm going to put it out there. That's a facility that um, was closed because basically it was condemned, um, and all those residents were moved into Prince Edward Home. Um, so does that facility um, sit vacant now, and are, are there plans for it? Um, you're right. That would be within Health PEI. Um, and we'll try to get some information. Okay, and hopefully we're I didn't going there next. But <laughs> not, maybe not today, but. <laughs> okay. Stratford. No, that's good. That was all my questions. Okay, shall a section carry? 
Total capital expenditure, health and wellness, twenty-six million thirty-one thousand one hundred. Shall I carry? Yes. Page nineteen, capital expenditure, health PEI, two thousand twenty-three, two thousand twenty-four budget estimate, equipment appropriations provided for information technology purchases, system modernization and equipment. Equipment twelve million sixty-two thousand seven hundred. IT system modernization two million one hundred sixteen thousand. Total equipment fourteen million one hundred seventy-eight thousand seven hundred. Mermaid Stratford. Um, is there a handout for this? It's coming. Okay. <laughs> I apologize that I wasn't quite sure how far we'd be getting today, so... Uh, it's always a surprise. It's always a surprise, absolutely. <laughs> I'm pleasantly surprised, thank you. <laughs> 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 the, uh, okay, honourable members, uh, the handout will be copied and then uh, distributed around. Mermaid Stratford, do you have a question prior to, or do you want to wait? No, I can stake in and maybe there will be some answers in that, I'm not sure, but uh, that's fine. Um, so over the five years, um, the, or next year's budget, there's a big drop in the spending um, in equipment. Can you tell me why we have that drop in, in the spending? I'm sorry, I, I missed your question. I'm trying to get organized here. Yep, no problem. Um, so in equipment, um, there is a drop in spending. So can you tell me, I'll flip them back and forth, can you tell me why, um, can you explain the drop in spending um, from this year's forecast to next year's budget estimate, um, why we see that drop? Um, there, there is a couple of significant projects that, um, so I guess within when equipment, I'll back it up a little bit, there is the annual equipment purchase with the support of, of the foundations for uh, for all the hospitals, but pr pr predominantly the QEH and the PCH. So we are always kind of looking at a speed as to what is needed and what will be purchased. Um, but also in, within that um, line, there is uh, the replacement of a couple of big pieces. Um, the the um, linear accelerator, we, we're on a scheduled to replace that partition, one of those uh, devices at the QEH at the Cancer Treatment Centre. So we run two or three bunkers out there now, three. Um, so we're constantly kind of in a, a process of, of updating that equipment and replacing it. So um, the underspend within 22-23 related to some of the timing. Um, but as well, we, we did a, a PAX or a picture archival or retrieval system where they do the images for, uh, for um, radi radiology. So that is off and completed, so it, it won't be back for a number of years. So it's really the timing of some pretty significant pieces of, of equipment at, at the, the major hospitals. Mermaid Stratford. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm interested in the equipment, because um, we have some really significant community um, fundraising drives in order to purchase um, equipment for our for our hospitals. Um, but yet, in the budget, we see that that equipment is cut in 2024. Um, but it, there seems to be a great need in the community, and the community always comes together to to donate those funds in order to get the equipment. But it, can you tell me what do, what, how it's decided whether government will purchase those, that, those pieces of equipment or they have to go out to a fundraising campaign in order to raise the money for it? Uh, generally, most of the equipment at the hospital is, uh, is purchased through the uh, collaboration and with, with the foundations. It's, it's been a long-standing practice within, within PEI that... Uh, uh, and right back to when the Prince County Hospital was open, there was a major fundraising drive uh, for it to uh, kind of fit up the new hospital. Um, it's been a model that, that has worked and the, the public, I guess, has responded to. Um, what equipment gets purchased is, is on a needs basis. Um, the, uh, all the leaders within the, the various hospital uh, areas um, would meet with the foundation and with hospital administration to come up with a list of priority needs. Um, they would be then kind of working with the foundations to see what the campaign would support and, and how much uh, uh, funds are, are available. Uh, I know the, uh, the foundations are constantly raising almost in advance of the needs. 
So we're almost buying after the fact. So the, the money's in place with the, the foundation and uh, we are uh, kind of working with them to see um, what groups and categories uh, would be uh, kind of looked at for this particular, uh, a particular budget year. Mermaid Stratford. Okay. Thanks, Chair. And I don't think that we could function from an equipment perspective if it wasn't for the foundations, the hospital foundations and the, the incredible work that they do. I guess my question is, is it really their responsibility to do this? Like it's been common practice, but is it common practice because that need wasn't fulfilled in another way, so they've had to step up to the plate? Or I guess I just don't understand how, like, how it's determined whether government purchases a piece of equipment or you put that on the shoulders of the volunteers of the, founda of the foundations to do that work? Um, it's a pretty philosophical question. Um, like, <laughs> uh, you know, the foundations have been around for, for a long time and, 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 you know, have, I think, a lot of pride in, in being able to help out uh, fellow Islanders, and, and that's why they're successful in, in kind of the fundraising activities they have. Um, it's it's kind of been a way of, of island life, and um, one that I think has benefited both both government and and the hospital foundations. Um, I don't think they're out getting things that aren't required out there, so it, they are kind of meeting the needs on a on a, a daily, weekly, and annual basis, and and we hope that relationship will, will continue. Roommate Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And I certainly wouldn't be suggesting suggesting that they're fundraising for equipment that's not needed, just equipment that government is not buying. So they are filling a gap there, right? So I guess that's more of my question as to, I mean, they do incredible work, um, but they are filling a gap just like our food banks are just like you know our NGOs are they are definitely filling a gap of for, to purchase equipment that is needed for the health care of islanders yep. um, and so i i don't know if when we when you say that in the budget there's certain piece of equipment that we budget for and that we pay for from a perspective of island taxpayers i just i'm trying yep. to get to the crux of what's what determines whether that is something that would fall on the shoulders of the foundation? Who makes that decision? Or if it's something that government purchases? So obviously these, the, this piece, these pieces of equipment that going to the Cancer Treatment Center, government is paying yep. for that, right? Yep, yes. So um, what, what is the difference between yep. the two? That's, I just, just yeah. asking, Gord, because I don't sure. know no, that. And, and, and to be honest with you, I don't know either. I'll, I'd have to go back to say what is the criteria that the foundation would use mm -hmm. to entertain a purchase of equipment. Uh, I'll try okay. to get that for you. Okay. Mr. Okay. Ever, go Thank one you. more and then I'll switch over and come back to you if you choose. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so I'll go to, and I don't have any, um, I don't have any information on this or proof of this, but I hear it commonly from people who work in healthcare that there is equipment that gets purchased and then never gets used because we don't actually have the people on staff trained to use that equipment. So my question would be is what level of accountability you know if all of these all of this money is spent for those for certain pieces of equipment how is it um i guess how is it what what's the oversight there to ensure that i mean we when we have these pieces a million dollar piece of, of equipment is there that that it actually gets used for the reasons it was supposed to be used for Um, I think that's the job of the leadership at uh, Health PEI to uh, ensure that the tools are uh, available for the services that they are, are going to be uh, providing. I know we do have uh, great partnerships with some of, of the uh, Atlantic, other Atlantic hospitals in St. John, uh, Moncton and Halifax to do some of that tertiary level care that uh, we may not have the, the staff on, on board or the, or the, the equipment available. Um, so I think there's there's always a, a balancing as to how many islanders are going to be needing it, and uh, is this the right kind of purchase for uh, for the services being offered at at the various facilities? Okay, hey, O'Leary and Vaness. Thanks. Uh, you ex explained in uh, the health and wellness department that there was money put for the pharmacies, but can you explain the difference between the IT infrastructure improvements with the Department of uh, Health PEI versus uh, health and wellness. So I'm just wondering, is that more for the EMR or what are we talking here? 
Yeah, um, most of the IT infrastructure here would be um, the hospital-based systems. So they would be the Cerner, so the Cerner, Cerner system. based systems at the, at the hospital. And I know that um, there are definitely modules similar to what the EMR or the TeleSolution would have um, for uh, for the hospital-based solutions. Oh, Larry Inverness. Are they more just upgrades or modernization, or is there some new fundamental change that Cerna is going to be uh, required to uh, yeah. for, uh, to do? Yeah, I think that the the big one that we were um, undertaking over the last year and and into this year was the um, there was a hybrid chart. In, in place on the uh, OBGYN areas where they had some Cerner and some paper-based charts. Um, it was identified that that was a risk having two sets of records around and so there was a Cerner solution that they were going to implement for that particular service. So it would be, when Cerner was rolled out, there were many modules. We didn't take them all. Mm -hmm. We took the ones that were going to get the most bang for the buck and there, there are a few others that we've been procuring over time. Mm -hmm. Oh, Larry and Renes. What, what happened with the issue around the gynecological services that were where they lost appointments and all of that side of it? Is this something that will help correct that as well or, or uh, prevent that from happening in future? Is it a bit of a back firewall to that? <laughs> yeah, uh, you're way beyond my technical capability as to what happened there. I think I'm only reading the same things that you're reading. So. I'd Okay. Oh, no. I guess no further questions, Chair. Um, so I do have memory staff on the line, but actually we're at the end of government time for today. Perfect. Yeah. So I will keep you on my list. <laughs> chair, I move that the speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall I carry? Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration the grant of capital supply to His Majesty, I beg leave to report that the committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Sure, Carey. The Honourable Member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke, and the Opposition Whip. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Employment Standards Act number no. four. And I move seconded by the member from Summerside Wilmot that the same be now received and read a first time. Shaw Carey. Carey. Bill number 128, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act number no. four, read a first time. Overview Minister or Member? This bill amends the Employment Standards Act to expand the availability of paid sick leave to workers. In short, it grants workers one day of sick leave per month to a maximum of 10, 10 days in a calendar year, introduces record-keeping requirements for employers in relation to paid leave, and introduces provisions relating to a financial support program to support businesses through the transition to paid sick leave. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford and the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I call Motion 120. Shall it carry? Mr. Speaker, Motion 120 is currently under debate and debate was adjourned by the Honourable Member from O'Leary Inverness. The Honourable Member from O'Leary Inverness, third party House Whip. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I feel like a thoroughbred in a big race to about to start there. I've been sitting back here all day, not really having much to do, Mr. Speaker, other than the whole government to account in the capital budget. So, anyway, maybe I could get the podium. <laughs> get settled in there. 
So anyway, Mr. Speaker, as when I concluded uh, some of my remarks on this motion uh, the last time it was brought forward, uh, you know, I certainly acknowledge that uh, in my district, uh, power was out for quite some time. In fact, I had constituents that went 19 days without any access to power and uh, before it was restored. And uh, although you know, I will admit many, many were probably in the seven to nine days category with the, the majority of my constituents, but, but it certainly highlighted uh, the uh, reality of what, uh, you know, what we deal with in these uh, significant weather events. And I might add, Mr. Speaker, we're already now hearing a little bit about a potential tropical cyclone hitting for PEI in the weekend, Mr. Speaker. And I think this is where we in the legislature need to be debating these tip types of issues. And when the opposition party has brought forward a motion such as uh, that we're talking about here now, it's to make sure that we're better prepared to handle these because they are coming at a fairly frequent pace. We've had the experiences of Dorian, to which I don't think the, the government took any of the recommendations out of the Callan report or made it very much in, uh, in uh, regards to many of the improvements. And then we go through Fiona when we've, you know, went through quite a, quite a challenge with that. And we've seen many, many failures on many fronts. And, uh, you know, obviously as le members of the legislature, we take it upon ourselves to have legislative committees to uh, delve into these issues in a little more detail. What the information that is coming back is really somewhat shocking. <laughs> you know, I, I have to, uh, you know, reiterate the issue that the EMO coordinator said in our committee that they never thought power went out all across Prince Edward Island. <laughs> I, I find that the most uh, bizarre statement that a person could possibly make. And I remember the people in the committee, did, did we even hear that right? <laughs> you know, I, I, I would hope that, that our government and that our emergency measures organizations will, would have preparations for almost any possible scenario that could possibly happen, that there would be a massive bulletin board <laughs> that, you know, if it's a nuclear war somewhere or if the bridge collapses or if a ferry catches fire or if they all happen at the same time, that there would be some sense of preparation for that and that you pull that, <laughs> that note off the bulletin board and follow these steps. But it seems like they didn't even have that, Mr. Speaker. I don't know whether they're still dealing with homing pigeons to get information back <laughs> to, you know, to uh, what was going wrong. Uh, it, it's just astounding stuff. So, I, so that's why I think that uh, I feel compelled to uh, speak about this particular motion and sort of correlate the issues that have happened in my district on how you know, preparation could have been far better done. I know government will say, oh, it was the storm of the generation, and it probably was the storm of the generation for that particular situation. But we have more and more storms coming, and I question how much that the response changes based on the severity of the storm. You know, if, if, if the wind was five kilometers or 10 kilometers uh, uh, less, would that meant the response was different? If it's five or 10 kilometers more than what uh, we had in Fiona, would it mean the response would be different? The reality is, is that you have to take with whatever Mother Nature throws at you, and you have to be able to prepare the response for the aftermath, Mr. Speaker. And mostly what I've seen of the, of the big response is that it was mostly more of our, uh, you know, our volunteer providers, our fire departments, you know, they rescued. There was, I know, a, a neighbor of mine that uh, had a big storm surge and the water came into his house and he had to be uh, rescued. Uh, we've certainly seen uh, people in the community uh, helping remove uh, trees from uh, cars, uh, opening up driveways, checking in on their neighbors. That's the type of stuff that was responded to. And, you know, we, we even looked at even some of our uh, things that you'd assume that our emergency measures organizational group would be dealing with would be our warming centers and things like that. Well, in my district, there was a warming center that failed. It, it, the power <laughs> didn't even come on for it, the generators that were established. That's not having the, the preparedness and preparations that was required. Then when we get into some of the other fa uh, fallouts from this was that we didn't have the gasoline at our gas stations, EMO stated in the, on this floor of this legislature, the number one recommendation that they had from uh, Dorian was that they have a generation power options for the tank farm. 
So, you know, that, that didn't happen. We asked questions to Maritime Electric. How come that the, the generators that we do have in PEI couldn't have gotten 1,000 feet up the road <laughs> to get power? Then we find it, well, those generators are too big for the tank farm. Can't use that. Didn't have, we didn't have enough space for power. Okay, somebody didn't prepare on that. Then we find out, I, I found this one a bit astounding, a question period last uh, Friday, I'd ask the questions, uh, so if that was the number one issue, the Minister for Public Safety was the minister since July 15th and said she didn't know about that there was no generator at the tank farm until two days before Fiona hit. Now, I'm certainly not blaming anybody in here, but how could, how could EMO not have briefed their minister well in advance of two days before Fiona? I find that, that that's just something that just doesn't make sense to me. So, you know, so then we find out that it, it took more than two days to get the, the generator here to, to Prince Edward Island. We find out that the generator actually gets stuck over at the bridge it couldn't cross. What? You know, so now, it still, it still defies a bit of logic why it still took so much time. I wonder if the generator ever did arrive. Did they turn it back? What, what, what was the, the sequence of events that occurred? These are things that are big questions that I have as an MLA, and I think they're big questions that Islanders have. How could lineups to the extent that occurred for gasoline to, to repower generators, and in rural communities, mostly we all have generators. And uh, when we, we need some form of energy to uh, run those generators, Mr. Speaker. So, so somehow there was a failure of communication to inform the minister that that was the number one issue, or the minister just disregarded it as, no, nah, that's probably never going to happen. So those are the types of things that seem that somebody was not doing their duties and due diligence on, on a file like this. So now already we have a notification that there's another potential cyclone, the tropical cyclone, hadn't called Nicole. Now, they're talking at the weekend. Well, we're sitting here at Tuesday. So I would hope that generator's back over here by now, or heading this way. It's got a few more days to get here and get it hooked up and get it ready. That's why we debate these things in the legislature, is to make sure that we're raising awareness so these things don't happen again. And that's the... the point that we're trying to make. And when we talk about things of an inquiry or things of that nature, that's what that's the whole premise behind that is. And although I'll say as a, as a member, I feel inquiries could take a long time and could be costly, it seems I'm fading towards saying that this is probably what's going to have to happen here, Mr. Speaker, because the failures of this government continue on and on, and uh, it just makes it uh, hard for me to imagine that uh, you know, our emergency measures organizations have not prepared for such a likelihood that power would be out all across Prince Edward Island. Now, you know, I, I, I've talked, uh, we've seen observations here. When the ferry caught fire and <laughs> went down, another, once again, travesty that occurred that will have impacts on Prince Edward Island. Uh, what happens if the ferry had been down and the bridge went out at the same time? You know, something happened there. I, I'm told you have about, what, three or four days of food in Prince Edward Island uh, to uh, deal with that. How quick could we get the, the necessity of services here to Prince Edward Island under that? I wouldn't have much confidence that our EMO, EMO organizations could handle that, Mr. Speaker. And that's the premise behind why things of an inquiry, an investigation, and why thorough uh, review of what has occurred has happened, Mr. Speaker. The very definition of emergency planning is to prepare for the very worst of occasions. That's what we have them for. I can prepare for power going out for two or three days in my property. I'm sure many islanders can. They don't necessarily are able to prepare for 19 days. You don't assume that's going to happen. So that's why we have organizations like the Emergency Masters Organization to make sure that they're following through with that and, and looking after and preparing for Islanders. I, I uh, had a member statement here last week in the legislature about uh, one particular individual, Richard Guimond, who was the EMO coordinator in Lennox Island. Lennox Island was actually extremely well prepared. And I commend, I had a call, I think, from uh, one of the members here that suggested, you know, check uh, on Lennox Island. You know, Lennox Island, they had an emergency measures coordinator. They had generators ready to roll. They had gasoline. They were checking on them people. They delivered all those services. It was probably the best prepared <laughs> community in my riding. 
And, and uh, you know, that I, I certainly commend them for. And that's why I wanted to uh, raise that, uh, you know, and, and do that member statement to acknowledge what they were doing. I really was trying to send a single up signal to the government about the unpreparedness that they had, that some communities were better prepared than our provincial government, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, when it comes to, uh, if we get into the housing side of the situation, Mr. Speaker, we certainly talk about, you know, uh, we've seen in the news uh, seniors in their publicly owned apartments, no lighting, no generators, all they, they showed up with a bunch of cheap flashlights. At least they didn't bring the lavender seeds, Mr. Speaker, but they, they did show up with some cheap flashlights for some people to help them out. As, as sincere as that might be, that is once again a failure to prepare was a failure to make sure that these things were delivered to the services. You know, uh, that, that's, that's the type of stuff that I sort of see as I look around here. You know, we had, we had MLAs and we had volunteers, uh, people out there trying to provide uh, food, uh, some blankets, some things of that nature. The basic necessities that were supposed to be expected of our publicly owned facilities and our seniors didn't occur. They failed. They failed again, Mr. Speaker. People were on such things as medications and insulin, no refrigerators to keep the product cool. Food got spoiled. And you know, if anybody, I just, I just know uh, in many cases, uh, especially in rural Prince Edward Island, people prepare a lot. They have deep freezes, they have uh, lots of fish and they have lots of salt products, they have potatoes, they have all the things to try to prepare to get through the winter. Uh, they're they're uh, preserved some gardens. Uh, some, a lot of that stuff can be frozen don't have power, don't, and it's off for 19 days, and you don't have gas for your generator, you run the risk of losing all of those products, Mr. Speaker. And it's a lot of money, it's a lot of time uh, that people commit to that. You know, and then you know, we start to look at the government decided, well, we're going to have to provide a little bit of financial relief to Islanders. Then that failed miserably, oh, Mr. Speaker. I, I have, and I, I've said before, I've never seen a, a more mess of a delivery of a program in my time in this legislature, Mr. Speaker. You know, for the, trying to get a paltry, I might add a paltry, 250 bucks out to every household, and I might add it was government that set the criteria yes. at $250 as long as you are a household in Prince Edward Island. That's the criteria that was set. Now, is that too much? I don't know what the significance of all that is, but you should be able to deliver, if you're going to make that announcement, that somebody should be able to deliver a program to every household in Prince Edward Island. That, that, that's, that's the premise behind it. I've got people today, uh, yesterday, were in to see me Monday. I still can't get my $250. And I know their constituents. I know they live here. So many of them lived here for years. Some of them single moms. The list goes on. And they're still getting these run around to go to from West Cape to Summerside, and then, well, Summerside, no, I can't make it. So, well, how about Montague? Could you go to Montague? That's worse. <laughs> so I, I keep saying, I've asked questions in, in the, in the let, did anybody in these call centers for Red Cross have a map of Prince Edward Island on the wall? It, it astounds me that that didn't happen, that they did not understand Prince Edward Island enough. Now, I'll argue that they should, have had the they should have had an office in Western PEI to at least make it halfway as convenient for people. But when we asked Red Cross, well, we, we had no accommodations for our workers. What do you mean you had no? How, how, could, how could that happen? We have a Mill River Resort. We have the West Point Lighthouse. We have the Tignish uh, Heritage Fair, the Briarwood Inn. <laughs> I'm I can guarantee you there was rooms available. Yeah. But, but no said that it couldn't have one up here. You have to drive to Summerside. And I've spoken this legislature many times about how far it is to get from Derby to Charlottetown, from Milo to Charlottetown, from West Cape to Charlottetown, from Cape Wolf to Charlottetown, from Howard's Cove to Charlottetown, Mr. Speaker. It's a few hours of a drive for people. And, and as we see what gasoline prices are going to, that's, you know, that's costly. And I've had constituents that's called me three times they went to Summerside and still haven't got any money, Mr. Speaker. And it seemed like when, when the leader of the opposition and myself brought up a little bit of an awareness of this and got a little bit of the media attention over this, well, things did free up a little bit shortly after that. But it didn't, it didn't solve the problem. There's still people that are still dealing with that issue today, Mr. Speaker. Today. That's, 
That's unforgivable, really, that a government would be that callous in its uh, care for islanders that it, that it couldn't make sure that it delivers something like that. So you question, well, why did Red Cross, why, why, how could Red Cross not have delivered this better than they have? Well, I find out they don't have many volunteers in Prince Edward Island. They were looking at taking a lot of them from New Brunswick over to PEI. No hotels. Uh, uh, and, you know, so that is a big question. The, the people we interviewed from Red Cross, I think they were from New Brunswick. Do we have any representation for Red Cross in a pro province like Prince Edward Island to deal with these emergencies? Seems we don't. That shows, once again, a lack of preparedness by government and our emergency measures organizations to deal with this. The emergency measures organization is to deal with issues around, uh, you know, the preparedness and the aftermath. But the delivery of services, that's government. That's Red Cross. Red Cross, you know, I thought was, a, was an organization that was in the worst situations, the worst wars, the worst natural disasters. And I'm thinking, would you do an ID check in, in the middle of the Sahara on people that are starving to try to find out whether they should get food or not? I'm guessing they wouldn't. It's about the humanitarian efforts to try to deliver some services here, Mr. Speaker. And although I'm sure, trying not to compare you know, uh, places like Sudan and Congo and things to, to Western PEI or Prince Edward Island in general, but you assume that the principles of humanitarian aid were to deliver at least 250 paltry dollars to people that were impacted by Fiona. And everybody was impacted, we all know that. Everybody's power went out. And to make matters worse, Mr. Speaker, I've been around my district, and it seemed like it was the, the ones that were having the most difficulty were the ones that were probably, in my estimation, I don't know bank accounts and I don't know people's personal situation, but they were probably the most in need, Mr. Speaker. Exactly, yeah. And, you know, so the 75% of people that got their money probably weren't that as high in need, but they got their money pretty seamlessly, and I appreciate that. But the fact that 25% of my district had trouble, and they were the people that were probably, once again, in my estimation, the most in need, says that there was a major gap in, and failure on behalf of the delivery. And all the time, government sit back and watched Red Cross do this. They never seemed to intercede. We asked questions, you know, to Maritime Elected, did the, the, the government ever, no, just kind of said, how are you doing? Thanks, good, you're safe, and if we can help in any way, let us know. Why, why? Access PEI was not involved in trying to help Red Cross deliver the services is another thing. And I know this minister is a good minister, and I, I'm going to say this, the Minister of Transportation was the only minister that actually reached out to me and said, is there anything we can do to help, and, and can you help us by providing us some uh, contractors and people who could uh, help expedite opening up highways and roads and stuff like that. So I certainly commend that minister for that. <laughs> But, uh, but I'm always a critical person, but, you know, I, I don't, get, don't get too uh, rested and uh, assured in, in your, your great work there. But, but I will say, I, I, want, I just I did want to single that, that minister out on that situation. And I'm not looking for more pavement, uh, you know, but, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but anyway, but I'm just saying that's the type of stuff that it logically did not make sense. If you're trying to do an identity check on an individual, I can only assume that the, right off the bat, your property tax record says all the residences that are out there. Now, yes, you still have who's tenants, that's another factor, but maybe they could have been the ones to have applied, and you would have reduced the amount of backlog and the amount of people on ID checks. There was things that you could have done, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And uh, I'd also argue that the maritime electric uh, billing system of uh, who pays uh, Electric, you should know all the residents from that, Mr. Speaker. So there's things that they could have done, but this government seemed to take a very hands-off approach and uh, let Red Cross, I don't know, just fumble along in trying to access and deliver these services, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we had situations, Mr. Speaker, where there were some people who were supposed to get a pre-authorized pre credit card. I think there were seniors that were to get $100 a pre-authorized credit card. I had four or five of them in my district that showed up at the local uh, grocery store with their, with their $100 worth of groceries, which obviously wouldn't be a whole lot, and the, and the card had no money. They drove all the way to Summerside to get a card <laughs> and come back and had to put their groceries back. How humiliating and demeaning is that? Now, now some of them did have enough money to cover it, and they kept going, but, but that's, and they were mad, and they were calling me 
about, the, about that failure. Wow. It just seemed like in every place we went, there was a failure, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, so, you know, I just really certainly think of uh, the realities that we were faced with just weren't good enough, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, so like I say, today I still have constituents, don't have money, uh, still trying to get access to it. I still have businesses and farms that are trying to uh, access the disaster relief program, filling out their paperwork. Uh, farmers, I, I brought up to the, that fine minister over there responsible for the island waste watch, watch system that I had farmers that had roofs blown off and steel and, and uh, fences that were twisted up. And, uh, but they were trying to get their crops in, they were trying to dig their potatoes, they were trying to do all that. And when it come time to uh, try to start cleaning that stuff up, then they find out there's going to be fees at Waste Watch. Now, I'm confident that minister will do some investigative work into that and get that straightened out. But I think you need to extend that, you know, that uh, free chance for to take uh, products to Waste Watch uh, because of Fiona. And, uh, and I'm fearful that as Nicole comes, if there's any wind at all, there's going to be trees, if it's the other direction or whatever, there's going to be more trees down and more problems. So, so we need to, uh, need to really prepare for that, Mr. Speaker. So I look at this, and I'm going to kind of conclude my remarks here, but this is a complete failure by our emergency measure organization. It's a big, big failure for our uh, maritime electric vegetation management plan, Mr. Speaker. I mean, they're, they're guaranteed, a guarantee on investment, and once again, all the trees that come down, it's a failure. But they, like I even went to someone and said, you can cut more trees along my property a little farther from the, underneath the line. Oh, we can't touch a tree outside our boundary. And so you, you do a few of them underneath, well, what's all the ones on the other side? <laughs> that makes no sense. So, you know, it was a complete failure by a Red Cross in delivering our, our short-term disaster relief to Prince Edward Island, and it was a failure by government who oversees all of that to make sure that that delivery and that process went good. And, uh, you know, and I feel that process of providing disaster funding for damages to woodlots, farms, aquaculture, and other uninsured peril to business and homeowners, that is the, what's coming up next. Let's hope that works out a heck of a lot smoother in all these, so that money gets out to people as possible, as soon as possible. But I have to admit, Mr. Speaker, I have little confidence in, in this government delivering that. But I will be supporting this motion because, because of what the severity of what I'm saying here, Mr. Speaker. I was hoping we could do something faster and better, but uh, I guess it seems like we're going to have to go this route, Mr. Speaker. So with that, I conclude my remarks and look forward to hearing other comments. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, Third Party House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it's a, I don't know, it's not a pleasure to rise and support this, but I, I'm going to support it because it's very important. But even this condemnation of government is where is where we are right now. You know, we, a lot of MLA sat through a lot of different committees and heard pieces of how we responded. And even today, telecommunications companies are in. Then I'm, st I'm staring at the Dorian report. The Dorian report says, moving forward, EMO will invite other telecommunications company providers to virtually participate in the PEOC briefings when activated to ensure all fully understand the status and restoration of essential services. Find out today that they weren't even invited. This is in the Dorian report. This is in the Callian report. This, is, this was prescribed to us as a best practice to move forward. And you don't have to stop there. Um, communication strategies to target vulnerable populations could be improved in the Dorian report. You know, you have, you, have on the, you have on the next page, when transitioning to recovery, some processes were not well understood or executed. To recovery, look at 501 Queen. 40 days later, and it's raining inside their house. And I mean, we don't want to, we don't want to, on this side, we have to do a job. And to, to see people living um, in conditions like that, where, where we've given government enough time to do it, and then you come back in, if you walk in there, your glasses would fog up. That's how much water was in that building. And it doesn't stop there. I mean, I want to give some, some credit to uh, the minister's housing staff. Once they, they came, they were there at different areas um, to, to look after the people, but the conditions of the units, the senior facilities were not appropriate. 
and we could have done better. In this report, it says that human resource issues across government are important and need to be looked at in case this happens again. And I've said in here before is that every single person in government had to become a housing officer. Every single person has to become a housing officer next time to make sure we're taking care of the, the issues in the places that we need to look at. Before I run out of time, I want to say a special shout out to a constituent of mine that we need to learn a lot from, um, how he drops everything in his life and he, and he just contributed to helping others in his community, and that's Tristan Gray. Um, really worked hard in our community to take care of Hunt Court. And it wasn't just him, it was his whole family and uh, many other people. So I just wanted to make sure that, that he understands that. And then the last thing, because that's all I'll have time for. It, in my, in my community, when, when you go up, and, and Beach Grove Home affects a lot of people and a lot of families, and that's a tough time when their families are there, but it's a beautiful place, and there's been a lot of great stories and a lot of great volunteers, and the staff there are incredible. But it's up in a difficult place to get to once all the trees are down, and I understood that and did whatever I could, but when, when we find out that the isolation of that road and that strip becomes something that government needs to know about. They have to know that in case of an emergency, that becomes a difficult place to get power restored to. So you think, you think that that's, that's okay, great. Well, come to know, I'm, I'm up there talking to the staff outside because we're, we're, we're trying to mobilize the community to get in there and see some people in long-term care. And, and, and the, some of the staff people said, Mr. Speaker, they, they didn't have a generator suitable. The generator they were using was so old, it could only run for certain minutes at a time. It gets better, Mr. Speaker, because the generator that this House approved in a capital budget had been purchased, or should have been ready to go, so, sorry, it was approved. I'm not even sure if it was purchased or not, but it wasn't installed. It was not installed before this happened. So the word condemnation, I can't get over the fact that, that a new generator was sitting somewhere in a box and was not installed for people living in long-term care, one of, the, one of the biggest, most sacred places that I've, I've, I've ever seen in Prince Edward Island. So this is a condemnation, this is a failure. We, and, and you know what I found out right now is that it's, it's gonna be installed next month. Next month. Next month. Another you have to go through. So I'm going to conclude right now because, no, no it, was, it was approved by this government. This government has to take responsibility for that. And somebody needs to be apologizing for not getting that generator in because that's just unacceptable. I'm going to calm down now, Mr. Speaker, and I will adjourn debate seconded by O'Leary and Vanessa. Shola Carey. The Honorable Member from Royal Donna and the Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I move that uh, Motion 125 uh, be now read. Shall I carry? Motion 125. The Member for Royal Donna moves, seconded by the Member for Rustico Emerald, the following motion. Whereas the week of November 5th to 11th is Veterans Week. And whereas the service and sacrifice of generations of Canadian veterans have helped create the country we love today. And whereas 2022 marks significant milestones, including the 20th anniversary of deployment of Canadian forces to Kandahar, the 80th anniversary of the Dieppe Raid, and the 80th anniversary of the Battle of St. Lawrence. And whereas communities across Prince Edward Island will be holding events and ceremonies to commemorate Veterans Week, culminating in Remembrance Day on November 11th. Therefore, be it resolved that this Legislative Assembly extends its profound thanks and appreciation to the generations of men and women who have bravely served our country in uniform and those who do so today. The Honourable Member from Royal Donna, Government House Leader, to start debate. Oh, podium? Meraldona.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's my pleasure to rise today to move this motion, motion 125, remembering and honoring our veterans. With Remembrance Day approaching this Friday and the week of November 5th to 11th being Veterans Week in Canada, I felt it was timely to bring this motion forward to debate by members. The fact that we have gathered here today in this legislature to freely and democratically debate matters of public policy and public is in no small part to the thanks to the tremendous service and sacrifice made by generations of our veterans. There wouldn't be a member of this House whose family or communities weren't impacted by the service and sacrifice by generations of our island veterans. In the district that I represent, Moraladona, the tales of valor and the small communities like Morel and St. Peter's are long-held articles of faith, Mr. Speaker. During the Second World War, those villages had some of the highest per capita enlistment rates in all of Canada. That's a source of pride that's been passed down from one generation to the next in our communities. As time marches on, there are historic milestones that become further in a rearview mirror, so it's important that we make the effort to honour and remember each year. This year, for example, marks the 20th anniversary of the Canadian forces arriving in Kandahar, Afghanistan. That doesn't feel like it was that long ago, but in the blink of an eye, two decades pass. So when it comes to events from conflicts even further in the past, it becomes more challenging and more important to make sure that the veteran contributions are recognized. Today, November 8th, is National Indigenous Veterans, Affair, Veterans Day. Earlier today, I had the honour of representing the province at an Indigenous Veterans Day ceremony in the district, Mr. Speaker, in Abbeywood First Nation. It was deeply moving to participate in this event and join with the community in honouring their veterans. Mr. Speaker, um, Elders uh, Doreen Jenkins and Georgina Crane were there. Uh, Councillors Jake Jadis and Chris Jadis and Sherry Bernard were there. Uh, Chief Poole had sent a video message, Mr. Speaker. Senator Francis was there. He joins us every year. Uh, Superintendent Kevin Lewis and local uh, veterans were there. MP Sean Casey. No, Mr. Speaker, and you would appreciate this. Uh, the students from Abbeywood and Manchester Consolidate were there this year, Mr. Speaker, the grade 7 and 8 classes. It was held indoors this year uh, in the uh, in the centre, and uh, next year at the the new Abbeywood Connects building, they hope to have a bigger crowd and more students from all the surrounding schools there. So the three principals there, one from Manchester Consolidate, Morale Consolidate, and the high school were all there as well. And uh, even uh, uh, some of the mayors were there, Mr. Speaker. The community of Abbeywood does uh, a great job of really educating the surrounding communities. They bring uh, them in, they welcome them. Um, it's very much uh, you know, uh, an excellent atmosphere that, that's happening there, and I really appreciate it. And uh, more and more people are coming each year, and it's important. Um, uh, Tyler Gould was the MC there, and him and, and uh, Councillor uh, Sherry Bernard delivered uh, messages about the past, and uh, you know, significant mistakes in our past, Mr. Speaker and talked about, you know, uh, reconciliation and the things that we have to do and change. Um, I would encourage anybody, uh, if you uh, get the invitation or, or happen to be in the area, to, uh, to participate. It's, it's uh, quite a moving ceremony. Um, during uh, Veterans Week, it's timely to remember the brave young members of our community who enlisted to serve our country. Their story and the story of our Indigenous veterans is one that needs to be remembered. That shared history between our nation's armed forces and our indigenous veterans runs deep. When our country's armed forces have been called upon throughout our history, indigenous Canadians have been there. These uh, Samoganese or, or soldiers uh, bravely and honorably fought for our country um, when their place in their country was clearly less than defined. The brave footsteps of these Samoganese were taken well before the long walk of reconciliation that we are embarked upon today. You know, Vimy, Dieppe, Capion, uh, Sarajevo, Kandahar, these are among the way stations traveled by Canadians' Indigenous veterans. More than 7,000 Indigenous Canadians fought for our country during the First and Second World Wars, with dozens of young Islanders among them, and not all of them returned home. Uh, for those who were fortunate enough to return home, they had years to struggle ahead, trying to come to terms with the horrors that they'd been exposed to while serving in uniform. Uh, you know, the work to properly support our veterans uh, after they return home uh, continues today, Mr. Speaker. Proper mental health, housing, job training uh, supports our veterans for our veterans are all key. The events of, uh, events of Veterans Week are a timely reminder of how far we have come and how far we need to go to support our veterans. You know, I encourage all members to check out uh, the local Veteran Week activities in your communities. 
uh, Mr. Speaker, you know, after the uh, the ceremony in in Abbeywood, uh, today, there's a there's a beautiful new cenotaph. Um, you travel this way a lot, Mr. Speaker, but if you look up on the on the far hill towards the uh, the northeast, and I drove up, and it's where there's going to be there's a healing grounds there, and there's going to be a, a cemetery, and a healing garden, and there, there's a new cenotaph there. And you can see right over the Hillsborough River, where you know you know thousands and thousands of years of, of Indigenous peoples have traveled, Mr. Speaker, and it, it, it was nice. I, I did take a moment and reflect on, you know, Veterans Week and especially on on, uh, on the Indigenous veterans as well. So I encourage everybody to take that time, uh, find that spot, and take a moment. You know, it is important that we go to our, our services, but take that moment and really think about it and uh, talk to others about it. And I look forward uh, to uh, support for this motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable member from Rustico Emerald. Can I get the podium, please, as well? Yes, please. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I really am pleased to rise today to second this motion uh, from my honourable uh, colleague and the member from Moraldona. And I really commend him for bringing this forward. I mean, Remembrance Day is, as I think we we'll all agree, such an important day to acknowledge and, and recognize. Um, and this motion, I think, is very important it's that we take and we pause here in the Legislative Assembly as elected members to, to really to mark these significant milestones, uh, the anniversaries, of course, um, deployment of Canadian forces to Kandahar, the 80th anniversary of the Dieppe Parade, and the 80th anniversary of Battle of St. Lawrence. But really to, to recognize um, all of the generations of men and women who have bravely served uh, our country in uniform and give them our thanks and appreciation. Um, as as was, uh, was alluded to, as was, was mentioned, uh, we all uh, have special memories, I think, of, of attending a Remembrance Day service. And the Remembrance Day services, I think, across the island are very, very special. I know in, in my district, uh, 18 Rustico Emerald, there are several that take place. And, um, you know, there's ones at the Cenotaph in Wheatley River. There's one it's, it's just outside my district, but the Cenotaph in, in, in Hunter River. Um, one that uh, I always find very special every year is at the Cenotaph in, Ca in Cavendish. It's right on, the, right on the ocean, right on the cliffs. And there's always a piper playing. Ryan Simpson has done that for several years, who just lives in the area. And, um, you know, usually it's a cold day and the wind is blowing, and it just brings back memories of, of what uh, those brave men and women had to go through when they, when, they, when they fought overseas. And when those pipes come up and echo off those cliffs, um, it's a feeling that um, that's hard to replicate. Um, and Mr. Speaker, also uh, in North Rustico, uh, the cenotaph there was recently relocated right into the center of town. It was where the, the, the co-op store sent, uh, sat, pardon me. And, and um, you know, this is why our municipal councils are so good. They chose to take this, this prime piece of land right in the middle of the village, of the town, and they said, this is where the cenotaph has to go because this is so important. And um, it's, a, it's a beautiful cenotaph and park year-round. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, when it comes and, and Remembrance, Remembrance Day comes near, um, the Knights of Columbus and the local veterans are really, they, uh, they have, have created for, uh, over 420 crosses, one for each, uh, each veteran. And um, they, they work with, uh, often with, with the local youth and schools to erect those around the cenotaph. And um, it, it's very moving, and, and it's not just for Remembrance Day, but they're already up. Uh, and uh, I, again, like the member from Moraldona, would, would say if you're in the area, just, just stop by and, and take that in. And I want to thank all the people that are, are involved in that, because it really dry, it does drive home um, the sacrifices that are made, the number of people that were involved, and uh, how important it is to the history of, of that community and the whole surrounding area. Um, and speaking of, of North Rustico, Mr. Speaker, I thought I'd focus a, a little bit on what they do in that community. Um, at the Gulf Shore Consolidated School, if you go into the, the lobby or the foyer, in fact, um, 
prominently placed is one of the first things you see when you go in are, are, are photos of all the veterans that came from North Rustico and surrounding areas. So every day when our teachers and students go to school, this is what they see. And, and, and um, I think that's so important because uh, remembering uh, our history and the contributions of these men and women is not something that's just about one day a year. It's really about remembering year round. And I know that the students at Gulf Shore Consolidated take it very, very seriously. Um, every year, the Remembrance Day ceremony at the school is one that is, is incredible, Mr. Speaker. Um, of course, they have a, a really great uh, concert band there, and, and they play at it. Um, every class goes, and they all place uh, wreaths uh, up at the, the, on the stairs at the front of the stage. But uh, one thing that was started uh, a few years or several years ago now was photos of of the relatives of students at the school who served in the armed forces um, are, are, are put together in a slideshow. And the entire uh, auditorium and everyone gathered there is treated to that slideshow. And the, these are family members of the students who are sitting there in the gym. And, um, and it, it's, just, it's just so moving and it just brings home the direct connection of our veterans to our current population. This is not an abstract thing. This is the aunt, the uncle, the great aunt, the great uncle, the grandfather, the great grandfather. Um, you know, the, uh, these are our relatives with a direct connection. Um, and, and another thing, uh, Mr. Speaker, during the pandemic, of course, large Remembrance Day ceremonies uh, had to be discouraged or, or not held officially. But I tell you, North Rustico, people remembered. They gathered safely, of course, and I mean, a couple of, of things, I mean, music really moves me, Mr. Speaker, but uh, um, I wanted to, to, uh, to thank the McLean family. Um, so Kirsten and Matthew McLean, every year they go and uh, they take it very seriously because of their connection to veterans. And uh, Kirsten McLean was the uh, the music teacher at uh, Gulf Shore Consolidated. Just this year, she has gone to Bluefield to teach there. Uh, they're very lucky to have her. Um, but they would come out, whether you know pandemic or not, and of course, uh, play the trumpet. Um, the leader of the official opposition does a fantastic job of that as well. Um, uh, playing the Re Re Reveille, I believe, and then the, uh, the last post. And, and Kirsten just did a fantastic job of that. And then her husband, Matthew, would come and play the pipes every year. So extremely moving, Mr. Speaker. And, and Mr. Speaker, I think, and maybe it was mentioned uh, earlier, in today's world, unfortunately, this is still relevant that wars are being fought and people are dying, and uh, it's, it's hard to believe that even in today's modern world, we could still be on the brink of, uh, of a world war. I mean, what's going on in the Ukraine with the invasion of Russia? We really are in a position where here, once again, um, you know, we're in 2022, and we're in a position where all it takes is one wrong move by one leader or one group of leaders uh, deciding to move in one direction, and we could be there again. And, you know, we, we could be those people who are marching off to war, our sons, our daughters. Uh, it's overwhelming, Mr. Speaker, to think that could still happen. So, Mr. Speaker, um, I did want to uh, talk a little bit about the motion and, and what, uh, what milestones it was recognizing, or it is recognizing. So in, uh, with the 20th anniversary of Kandahar, uh, the Canadian troops arrived in January 2002, and there were more than 40,000 Canadian Armed Forces uh, that served in the Afghanistan theater of operations, and that was between 2001 and 2014. And 158 Canadian Forces members were killed during that conflict, and many more were wounded or injured. 
Um, so this was this was 20 years ago, Mr. Speaker. 40,000 forces, 158 members were killed. And um, of course, this year marks the 80th anniversary of the Dieppe raid. So that was August 19th, 1942. That was the date of the battle. And there were, uh, um, in my notes here, I have around 6,100 troops at the battle that were Canadian. Um, and there were, were specifically, uh, there were the ones that were specifically embarking for that operation uh, to fight there. Uh, there were 4,963 earmarks specifically for that operation. That's why they went over. And only 2,210 returned to England, and many of those were wounded. Uh, there were 3,367 casualties, including 1,946 prisoners of war. And, uh, and it, was, it was just a, it was a, it was a deadly, deadly uh, battle. So that's why we remember that this is the 80th anniversary of the Dieppe parade. Also noted in the motion is this, the 80th anniversary of the Battle of the St. Lawrence. Um, as, as I think most know, this was a major air and naval battle from 1942 to 44 in the St. Lawrence River in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Um, the only major battle of World War II to take place within Canadian waters. And uh, one of the notable events that took place there was the HMCS Charlottetown was sunk on September 11th, uh, 1942. So that's one, again, very close to home, and it brings home. That was 80 years ago, but it really brings home um, how these, these world wars have happened in the past, and we were directly involved, and they could happen again. So, uh, so Mr. Speaker, um, I would be remiss in speaking to this motion if I, if I didn't um, thank uh, the organization, of course, that uh, our veterans belong to, and they, the, that's the, the legions here on Prince Edward Island. I know that there's, they've had their controversies and their struggles, but they are the main uh, organization that represents our, our veterans. And I know that uh, they have taken up uh, their cause very seriously to make sure that we never forget. And we, we don't have those, those huge uh, wars again, and so people don't have to suffer the same things that they suffered. Um, they want they want to make sure that that torch of remembrance is, is kept and held high and well lit. They want to educate current and future generations, and of course they want to help support our veterans who are still here. And of course on Prince Edward Island, the uh, we have the government uh, headquarters of the government department that looks after our veterans, and I want to acknowledge all the work they do as well. Um, one of my uh, uh, friends uh, who comes from North Rustico and who uh, I believe now right, resides in Charlottetown, um, he kind of moves around a little bit, but uh, is Dave Black here. And uh, David Black here um, is, is part of the Legion, and I believe he is um, the person responsible for the island-wide poppy campaign this year. So I wanted to, to thank David uh, for stepping up to do that. He was a former... Um, a fire marshal here with the with the province, and um, and I know uh, the money that they raise through through selling the poppies and uh, not selling them, I should say, through donations from the poppies will be put to to, uh, to very good use. Um, and and you know, Mr. Speaker, um, every year I get a call uh, from from the the Legion at, to donate to their their campaign which is really it's that never again issue just to educate people youth and others and just keep it top of mind that we can't have these wars happen and and every year i mean it, it, it's it's crazy mr speaker i think oh this is another telemarketer who's calling me to try and get that money but every time i think and i remember and i and i do donate a small amount uh, to that effort and, and i would encourage uh, everyone uh, here to do so so with that, Mr. Speaker, um, I, of course, uh, support this motion, and I, I, I hope that all members here do. And um, uh, once again, I want to extend, as it says in the motion, profound thanks and appreciation to the men and women who have served to allow us to be here today in our democratic society. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
The Honourable Member from Fisheries and Communities. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank the Honourable uh, Members for bringing this motion forward. Um, I don't need the podium. Um, everybody knows I'm a veteran and I uh, served for 12 years in the Armed Forces, and I'm very proud of that fact. And I think we, uh, it's all upon us to, um, to share our experiences with veterans and, and promote what they've done over the, over the number of years, hundreds of years, uh, uh, for us as a country and what they, what they continue to do for us going forward. And uh, the other night, the honourable members from the opposition and I, we attended um, at least, at least we forget, um, event in Summerside. It was called Night of Remembrance. And it was uh, put on by phase two and the members of that committee and it was held to Silver Fox and they played songs and gave tribute to our veterans that have served and continue to serve today. And uh, I think events like this are very important to tell the story. I believe in, I believe in telling the story of our past and it's about our, our, our veterans and about our uh, First Nations people who have served and about people that have made contribution to our country as a whole. Um, and I think we have, a, we, have I say, we have a duty to do that. Um, I was in uh, uh, the Inglewood School the other day. I'm going to work backwards here and, and, and just talk about some things that I've seen over the last um, little bit, Mr. Speaker. And I was in Inglewood School yesterday, and uh, some, of the teach, uh, some of the students there had pictures of veterans up, and they had little drawings and pictures and uh, posters and stuff like that. And I think that's where it starts, back to where our students are. And it's nice to see that stuff. And something I've always felt a little bit um, sad about is, is not being able to get to all the Remembrance Day services that are in our areas. And uh, I give credit to the legions and, and, uh, and these organization committees. They try, to, they try to move them around and have them in times when politicians and different people can attend the different events. And I think that's very important. But I, I, it always makes me sad to think that I, I can't get to that event if it has to do with Remembrance Day because of another event that's going on about the same thing. And it, that's something that, that does bother me. Um, we now have the Legion have new signs out. And there's ones you, you put in your front of your house that says, least we forget. And uh, you can buy them from your local Legion or make the contribution to get a sign or you can order them online. And I think we need to do that. I think we need to take the time to get them signs and put them in our front yards. And we're the poppy. And, and, uh, and continue to promote that. Um, I give, I give uh, a lot of thanks to a DVA um, for what they're doing now. They're, they're telling the stories along with the Canadian Armed Forces in, in stories of remembrance of the soldiers and airmen and Navy personnel that were out there. And uh, it's always interesting to hear where they're from and, and, uh, and what the contribution they made. And the contribution could be simply is maybe they, they weren't allowed to go and sign up and go to war because they were needed here in Canada. Or they might be needed in the United States to keep industry going to help with the war effort. And uh, I, I think that's, that's, there's them type of stories also. Uh, two weeks ago, I had the privilege of being invited um, by the, the Admiral, Admiral Dwyer um, and Ambassador Cohen to uh, attend the uh, USS Gerald Ford in Halifax, and I was able to talk to uh, airmen and soldiers, or sailors, I should say, from eight different countries that are making up the second fleet. They're on the way from Halifax uh, out into the Atlantic and into the, uh, the, the northern waters um, in protection of our sovereignty. They're, they're out there, and they're, that's what they're there for, to, uh, to represent us. I think that's very... Uh, it's, it's, it's always good to talk to them, to them sailors, and I think we need, as politicians, we need to make sure that we stand in front of them here in our country defending what they're doing for us. And that's something I very strongly believe in. Um, because they, our soldiers, our airmen, our veterans, and our, uh, and our, our sailors, they need our support. And they need to know that we're there behind them, in front of them, promoting what, I shouldn't say promoting, but in support of them, because they're supporting our country. I had the, uh, the chance this summer to, uh, to go on board uh, HMCS uh, Kingston, HMCS Summerside, and they were gearing up to go over to the Ukraine, Ukraine conflict. And they were embarking U.S. Um, Special Forces units to provide a certain type of 
resource to the conflict over there in Ukraine. And a lot of people wouldn't know that's happening. And, and the honorable member, he mentioned about, and, and so did this honorable member, about our members that are over there in the Ukraine conflict and on station doing stuff and doing training. And uh, I think that uh, just shows how good of our, uh, our country is, that we're, we're always there ready to help other nations when they need the help. And that's why I think as politicians, we need to support that. Um, You know, we have, we have a serious situation in Ukraine. And as the Honourable Member mentioned, it's very close to where it could be. Very close. And we must take pause, I think, and remember that. That in the past, these events, we don't want to see them progress. We don't want to see them develop into further conflicts. But we're close. And I think we must remember that, that as politicians, when we have these bilateral conversations and we make sure that we build up relationships so that we can have them open line of conversations between government and government on behalf of our country and things do not escalate. You know, veterans, they don't ask for anything. They don't ask for nothing. The only thing they're asking is us to remember them. And that's what we should be doing, and this motion supports that. You know, I remember back in the 80s, and I never really thought too much of it at the time, but in the 80s I was in Germany, and I was in uniform, and I was at the Czech wall with the Republic of Germany, and I remember the fences. I remember the no man's land. I remember the minefield. I remember the wall. I remember the, the, the guard towers. I remember the Czech soldiers with guns pointing down on us as we walked that and patrolled that line in a jeep. I can remember. I can remember being there and not thinking too much of it. But that was the Cold War. And nowadays, I start to think about that sometimes, that I was there. I saw them guys on top of that wall. I remember them pointing firearms at me. But calm heads prevailed, and we've seen the Berlin Wall and that come down. And I think that was a great day. But I don't think we can ever forget what it took them veterans to get us from there to where we are now. And I think that's very important. Two things I want to touch on. I'm going to have to, um, this week I'm meeting with the five Div commander. We're going to have supper together. And, uh, He'll be here for member state services. I'm looking forward to that, spending some time with the, uh, with the general. Uh, I've had him at my office. Him and I talk quite regularly, the odd time on chat and stuff like that. And it's good to hear how we can help him. And I can say thank you to the government that this week, or last week, I attended Halifax and I signed an agreement, the terms of reference between our government and the Canadian forces called Seamless Canada. I think it's something we can do to help our veterans transition into our province. And this agreement, which is now being, other provinces are coming online, we're signing it to, as a province, to say, what can we do? And that's the question I asked the Admiral on board HMC at Charlottetown. What can we do to help our veterans, our RCMP members, and our active service personnel that are coming to PEI what can we do to help you seamlessly transition into our province? And that's a project that I'm taking very seriously, and I'm, I'm hoping that every member of this House will help me with that and give me ideas of how we can help our veterans and our service personnel be welcomed by our province and, and make their transition as seamless as possible. And I will say that the Department of Transportation with the Honorable Minister there is an agreement in place when it comes to just simply as driver's licenses. But it also has to do with health cards and has to do with social services and real estate. It's it just the whole thing. So I'm very proud of that fact, and I'm looking forward to working on that project over the next year. But Mr. Speaker, I'll, thank you. Uh, with that, I'll end with this and uh, hope everybody else gets a chance to uh, support our veterans. And uh, with that, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> I guess I was over time there. Um, with that, I'll adjourn debate on this motion until the next time.
Seconder. Uh, second by the Honorable Minister of the Housing and Social Development. Show it carry. Yeah. Honorable members, the hour has been called. The Honorable Member from Morale, Donna, and the Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That was a, a nice way to end the day. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I move uh, seconded by the Minister of Social Development and Housing that this House adjourn until November 9th at 1 o'clock in the p.m. Shall I carry? Have a good evening, everyone.